starting off the podcast by talking about something, <laughs> I'm not and you just yet. interrupted I'm not, I'm not me to say yet. we should start Kasper's the podcast. Already recording. I'm recording though. it now. What's wrong with you can you? do it again now. Why have you no, ruined it's over. You've ruined start the podcast. It. You've absolutely ruined it. I can't... Can we reconvene the podcast next week? Next week? Next week. Next week. Never year. talk about this Move ever on. again. Next, next year. year. No, you were uh, telling me about battery power TV. No, it's ruined. It's spoiled. Soiled it. Soiled. No, we don't do that anymore. We have a new one that has uh, one of those rap singers in it. I still haven't written a rap for it yet. Well, it's got it's got rap singing in it already. You can write one if you want, but it's got a guy. The lyrics are basically, um, "I'm a corpse. I'm a corpse. I smoke weed. I'm a corpse. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a corpse. 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 I'm a corpse." I smoke weed. I'm a Listening to the Lunchtime Podcast. I'm Catsman with me, Animich. Kenichi, what's up, guys? Brandon. It's me. Moogle. Against all odds, I'm still here. And Specs. Yo. W- what are we starting with? Yuzu is kill. Oh, yeah. Nintendo sued Yuzu into oblivion. Nintendo sue this man. We all know Nintendo are uh, bad and evil, but now yeah, it's litigious. even more obvious that uh, Nintendo made two point four million dollars off this, which is nothing. Like the they their main reason for suing Yuzu was to say you took revenue from us for Tears of the Kingdom because people were able to play it early. One, just because people were able to play it early didn't mean that they hadn't already purchased that and they might have just wanted to get sort of the jump on it. Two all those people emulating it may have also been planning to purchase it anyway, and it made them more likely to purchase it. It, it doesn't matter. Two point four million dollars. Uh, yeah, but we can say that that probably wasn't the case. <laughs> like... Okay, so it probably wasn't the case. Two point four million dollars is not point two percent of the money that they probably made off the entire sales of that game, based on sort of projected kind of values that they would have made from the 21 million sales it had and it's less than 0.02 percent of their revenue for a year it's nothing the point of this was not because they had lost money on this the point of this was they wanted to shut down something that they can't control no the point of it you don't understand in 10 years time when they need a switch emulator they've got one with 99 percent compatibility and That's they don't true, have yeah. to care they don't nintendo doesn't use open source emulators they write all their own emulators in-house I've told you this. Yes, they, they, they could, but why would they now? They don't. They write all their emulators in-house. They always have, even for the GameCube and shit, they write all their emulators in-house. The point of this is, look, a conversation of piracy is irrelevant, because like... Because it's a big factor in this, but we'll brush it aside. It's irrelevant because... Because company bad. The emulator is a thing that people can make, and the fact that it's being used for piracy is Nintendo's argument, but ultimately, people should be allowed to make the emulator. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is like the case of you can't sue YouTube if someone puts up illegal content on YouTube. You, yes, can. you can! The DCMA lets you do that! That's why they have their existing DCMA copyright system, because if they didn't have that, it would put them on the line for illegal things uploaded to them, rather than the person who uploaded them. The problem with this is the copyright system itself, and in particular the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which basically 
instead of protecting creators, gives companies with a lot of intellectual property a shitty fiefdom that they can enforce by threatening people. Specs, what you're uh, what you're thinking of is the exemption under law for communications providers to be held responsible for the communications that go over their networks. Yeah, so you can't you of. can't sue the phone company for uh, terrorists, as an example, plotting terrorist attacks over their phone lines. Like that's that's how it works. I, I remember this being a thing from way back in like the image board style days and sort of t things like that, where people were uploading porn um, to image boards. There was this big court case that essentially amounted to you can't be sued because a user hosted an image that's under copyright on your platform has that changed since what i'm aware of you can't be sued only if you respond to that within the provisions of the digital millennium copyright act right so if you see that there's something there that shouldn't be there you need to ask to take it down yeah okay but the point is that people should be allowed to make emulators because that's legal. Correct. And Nintendo sued Yuzu, claiming that it was because... And there was a case uh, many years ago, Sony versus Connectix, which established weekly, it wasn't a high court, but it established basically that you're allowed to make an emulator yeah. without infringing copyright. What Nintendo did in this lawsuit is they said, Yuzu, uh, that, that's all fine, but what Yuzu does is it illegally decrypts encrypted nintendo switch games from the xci files that you rip them from uh which in infringes on a portion of the of the uh, dcma that says that you're not allowed to decrypt content like that and it's kind of a nebulous thing and we'll never know whether the nintendo would have prevailed in court or not although i suspect because yuzu folded so quickly they probably would have yeah uh, maybe there was some internal com conversations going on at yuzu that they shouldn't have been having there's rumors and shit that like they were sharing rips of roms of nintendo switch games between themselves to like develop the yuzu so that they could you know make the builds quicker so they could make them playable before release date. Yeah, we'll never know what route Nintendo would have gone down, but the point is, the Yuzu decryption algorithm is a generic industry standard decryption algorithm where you provide the game files and you provide the encryption keys. So the fact that Yuzu decrypts it is not really relevant because you're not doing anything more than a standard C++ library on a computer can do. I think that one of Nintendo's arguments here was that Yuzu's website was pointing people towards where to get decryption keys, which... It's shaky. I, again, like people are going to be able to get those. I, I don't think that just because you tell people how you can make your emulator work better is necessarily wrong. It's, it's like... Doing it in an official capacity, though, on your website i think i think yuzu just yeah sure emulators are fine blah 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 i think the um the sony case from years ago i don't know if that still holds water because it was decades and decades ago and things have changed a lot so it does but it wasn't like a high court ruling and it's the way it was ruled was quite ambiguous nintendo could have taken yuzu to court on the premise that they were making an emulator and that could have gone to court and Nintendo could have won, but they also could have lost. And if they had lost, it would have been really, really bad for them. Yeah. So basically, they didn't want to touch that. Mm -hmm. I think the, the problem is, really, Nintendo doesn't want people making emulators. Yeah. Otherwise, the thing is, they would have gone after the people who are making and sharing decryption keys, which is yeah. the bit that they complained about. Yeah. But they didn't. They went after Yuzu because they don't want people making an emulator and they saw an opening. Yeah. yeah. It's because the, the decryption key is useless if you don't have an emulator to use it with. Therefore, you go after like the top level thing that you can get at because that's the easiest way of exerting control over it. It's even worse than that because if Nintendo really cared about people emulating their games, they would go after Dolphin, they would go after um, oh, they could you be know, planning a, any, any they, number of yeah. N64 oh, emulators, 3DS, DS, whatever. Um, and I think probably it's just because this is current as well. Like They don't care as much about the stuff that they're... <laughs> Again, I said they're not really making much money off this, but it's it's something that... They make $30,000 a month off their patron. Yuzu were making money from this, which which is, which is a factor. No, that's not a factor, because Kinectix were making money and Bleem were making money, yes. and that was ruled entirely legal. But also, it's not making a big dent in Nintendo's earnings. Oh, no. That's not really important for this. 
No, Nintendo is like, oh, we're losing so much money to emulators whilst being the only company that hasn't announced shitloads of layoffs this year. Yeah. And they are currently valued as the, the biggest... Richest company in Japan, right? They are the richest company in Japan. Um, and yeah, they, they're posting record profits at the moment, I think. Yeah, for now. But if we remember the Wii U era, we had the jokes about the Nintendo coffins money coffins that they had and they had to have those because they were losing so much money so you gotta make as much money you never know when the next wii u nintendo has so much money they could release five wii u's in a row and still have money yeah it's true so get more money like i think they're the only major manufacturer that have on their website a section dedicated to emulators because like they they hate them and they've hated them for years like yeah. they they quite happily say on their website that the use of emulators is illegal which is not true yeah which I think is hilarious because the Switch Online has emulated snares and nares and exactly. N64 and they allow like Sega to produce their Genesis collection. It's hilarious. Oh yes. That's Nintendo approved emulators. Nintendo is intellectual property rights for me but not for thee. Yes. So like and that's that's fundamentally where they are with it. Uh in some respects it's nice that Yuzu folded. It's not nice that they had to be there in the first place. But if it goes to court and some fucking random judge, probably picked by Nintendo because they'll pick the court that they sue them in finds in favor of Nintendo that emulation isn't legal, that's the rest of the industry, like the, the emulation yeah, yeah. industry kind of fucked at that point. It could honestly happen, and that's really my fear, is not that any particular emulator will be bullied offline, I mean, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. what's happened, but the Nintendo could be looking for a, like, emulation in general isn't legal style ruling, which would be really fucking bad, particularly for archiving games. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the, the real risk here, is that people stop making emulators because they are worried about similar things happening to them in future, because at some point, all you're going to be able to play all of these old games on is going to be a PC, because all the hardware will be done and nobody's going to be able to manufacture that hardware anymore. All that they really have to do, though, is is make it unattractive to make emulators in the first place and people will start taking them off of marketplaces and stuff. You can see that that happened today with, uh, what is it, pizza emulators? Pizza one, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I'd never heard of that emulator before. I mean, either, but it's the concept that if you, if you are successfully able to sue a major emulator the minor ones will probably fall in line as well because they can't afford to be sued like that. And Nintendo, as we probably have read the article that was linked in, in the Discord earlier, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they have a history of chasing people in real life. That's, that's, that's creepy. <laughs> That's borderline, like, awful. Nintendo have, like, stalked um, hardware, well, no, software models, I guess. In the 3DS era, they went to a guy's house and they knew where he worked and they knew his close contacts and they knew his routine so they could ambush him, so they could tell him, you need to stop jailbreaking 3DSs. And he, he always said, I don't really want to facilitate piracy. It's a worry of mine that I might be doing that by making homebrew for the 3DS. But all I want to do is be able to make my own little games um, to play on my 3DS and to have more access to the file system and things like that. And they ambushed him at his home. They said, you got to stop doing this or we are going to take you to court. Um, they basically said to him, you give us all of your materials on your homebrewing stuff and give us all your information about contact details for other people who are doing the same thing and we'll leave you alone. And so he, he gave them that information because he was afraid that they were just going to put him in jail. It sucks because I've I really do think if you buy a 3DS, you should be allowed to use it however you like yep. because it belongs to you, not to Nintendo, and Nintendo should fuck off. I haven't read through it, but this was a case in um, law about smartphones where it was found that it was legal to jailbreak an iPhone and Apple didn't want people doing that, right? So it's kind of the same sort of situation as that. Wasn't it the Right to Repair Act, I believe it was? There's several cases like this. Like one, one was about the software end of it, which was the jailbreaking, because obviously Apple, when they were generating the first set of iPhones, they didn't want anyone going outside of their ecosystem, which is nice. But again, I've just paid like a thousand whatever local currency is for this, this, this computer device. Fuck you, I'll do what I want with it. Um, I get that. Nintendo... If they get their way, it will be like it is in Japan, because Nintendo successfully lobbied in Japan for any modification at the hardware level to consoles to be illegal. 
Like, and that's the thing in Japan, you cannot modify consoles in Japan, um, or you open yourself up to prosecution under this particular act. Which is bullshit. You can't even use save edit- editors, I think, in Japan these days. Save editors as well, it's, it's included, yeah. yeah. Well, Nintendo tried to sue GameShark back in the day as well, so... Oh yeah, Game Genie and GameShark and all the rest of it, like, if they had their way, it's, it's, it's how they say you can play games and no other way. Yeah, you can play games how they say and when they say. That's super fucked, yeah. There's a really good blog that uh, that Schlotz linked us to that I'll stick in the description of this podcast that's worth a read. It goes through every time Nintendo's tried to do anything like this in a big way um, and quite often have lost those battles because it's bullshit. I, uh, I haven't had a chance to post this in the Dream Hut yet because I had it last night. I had a dream last night where... Uh, Nintendo were taking uh, the Link to the Past randomizer developers to court because uh, and your, <laughs> because dream. modification of Nintendo games is illegal. You're not allowed to do that. And I dreamt that for whatever reason they chose to use footage from my like my races like I did a while ago in court. Oh, no. And they they are they said to the judge, "Yeah, you're not supposed to be able to fight Cold Stare with the with a fighter sword." And the judge went, "Yeah, that is strange, isn't it?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had this fucking awful dream. I was like, "Why? Why are you targeting me?" I can't believe you did that, Moogle, to Daddy Nintendo. You're not allowed. You're not allowed to go and fight Cold Stare with a fighter's sword. That's forbidden. Heineken, fuck that shit. Willy Wonka, the amazing chocolate man. Willy Wonka, Willy or won't he? In this case, he won't. He won't Wonka. The Willy Wonka experience, which, if you don't know, was advertised as a magical, wonderful land of chocolate and turned out to be uh, an an almost empty warehouse with a tiny little bridge in it and a little kiosk. (laughs) Everyone's seen it by now. I think this is the ultimate British news item. It's lovely, isn't it? Like This is how all British tourist things operate. (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to read you their blurb. Marvel at extraordinary props, oversized lollipops, and a paradise of sweet treats, the <laughs> website described. This event guarantees an immersive and delightful entertainment experience suitable for ages three plus years old. The guy responsible for this is a so called serial entrepreneur. A scam and by that artist. I mean he has 11 <laughs> books on Amazon that are. That are completely generated by AI as far as anyone can tell. It does feed in nicely to the next topic which is about AI art because didn't they use AI art for the to, marketing, uh, yeah. to, to do this as well, to, to advertise it? If I saw that webpage I'd be like, this is obviously not a real chocolate experience because they've not used real pictures, they've used AI generated pictures. Can the general public tell that apart though no they absolutely cannot that's interesting maybe that will uh make people more wary of this sort of advertising it's okay it's not like we're having an election soon it's fine <laughs> i mean the art in question like i wouldn't have expected it to be a photograph of the inside of the thing i would have expected it if you're taking me to chessington world of adventures do not give me a mock-up of what it's gonna look like i, I should clarify like if i saw the art that was used for it i wouldn't assume that that is a photograph of the inside i would assume that that was concept art or a mock-up or something similar whether that's like appropriate or not like whatever but like i think most consumers are going to assume it's an actual picture though yeah and that's clearly like the inside of a building in the in the fake one yeah the lollipop forest thing i could I could see that within the realms of possibility that someone could create something definitely, that looks like this. No, it's that's not true, actually, yeah. The Gene Wilder poster with his hands all fucked up <laughs> yeah. and his fingers contorting. <laughs> yes. That I can look at and say, that's AI. If I wasn't paying that much attention looking that for this being AI, I'd be like, oh, mate, yeah, that looks on to board. Can I trick old people into being smarter? No, unfortunately, you can only trick people into being stupider. <sighs> We've had some similar cases of things like this with like Fortnite World. Yeah. Where like World. was it something like three thousand people showed up to Fortnite World and it was just a a little assault course and a climbing wall in the middle of a field and people were <laughs> queuing for like three hours to get in and then there was nothing to do whatsoever. It sounds like actual Fortnite. Way. The cave experience was like in the back of a truck. 
To be fair, if someone told me I was getting, I was paying to go to a cave experience, and then like told me to just get into the back of a van, I would, <laughs> I would not get in. The only thing you could really do there was play Fortnite. <laughs> it, it reminds me of the the thing that Moogle talks about, where he went to a, a gaming convention, and it was just like setups for Fortnite, so people could play Fortnite. And there was a line to the Fortnite kiosk, right, Moogle? Yeah, I and remember. And people were in the line playing Fortnite on their phones. <laughs> it's wonder it's glorious. It's wonderful. Look at that picture that I've just posted. Like apparently that was on their website. If you saw that on their website and you thought, yeah, this is this is quality product, then <laughs> like Sasa Dre Lollipops, a pasadice of sweet teats. <laughs> sweet teats. The thing you don't realise is this this did happen in I believe this was in Glasgow, and this is just what reading Scots is like. <laughs> So <laughs> no, that's that one guy on Scott's Wikipedia who made it up. He just thought he could write Scots by writing English slightly wrong. Oh yeah. That's essentially what it is though. Let's be honest. Wow. Any Scottish listeners to the podcast, please write in, but we won't be able to understand what you've written. Oh also weren't weren't kids given like a single jelly bean for showing up? It was a third of a cup of lemonade. That and they ran out. There were instructions to hand <laughs> to hand each child one jelly bean. So generous. Wow. Well you could buy sweets for extra if you wanted, but they ran out of free ones they could give you. That Cooper Clown? Pals are stored in the balls. Have you heard about Power World? Power World? It sold 30 billion copies. It didn't sell that many. It was about 12 million, I think. 20 million, I think. It's the news item of a month ago. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're slow on the uptake. Are people still playing Power World? I feel like... No. Oh. It kind of vanished. Power World's alright. It's a fun enough time in the way that an open world survival crafting game is alright. It adds in the fun of catching little monsters and reading their descriptions, which is what people like about Pokemon. Has it got the Pokemon company sweating? Probably fucking not. They make no. enough money anyway. They're not going to adapt because of this, but it's nice to see something that is probably made by quite a small team, do fairly well. And it also, unfortunately, goes to show you don't really need to put that much effort into something for it to be a hit as long as you have the right marketing, I guess. Was the marketing even that, like, I, I don't know, there so. was that one trailer? It was Pokemon with guns. It was Pokemon with ak 47 Yeah, I vividly remember the first trailer got people talking. I remember the first trailer and everybody was talking, but then, like, it's not like there was, like, a drip feed. It just, then the game just came out and it was all word of mouth. I don't think they did that. Well, it, again, it was, like, a tiny, tiny development team of, like, 20 people or something. Apparently, they didn't even know what a rig was for a model when they were, when they were making it. I've heard a lot of stuff saying, like, ridiculous claims like they didn't have a github or anything they just put each build on a flash card at the end of the day and that was how they did their like quality <laughs> control i don't think it's true um they, they've said things like nobody knew how to make a game in unreal engine except for the lead dev so he had to teach everyone possibly that might be the case they apparently found at like an arcade or something wasn't they? i don't know something, or a convenience store it was a convenience store they found like one of their lead devs at a convenience yeah, store i, I think I, or something I like that they or... are really the new nintendo because they're making all these crazy miyamoto stories yeah, up yeah. on the fly this is a classic case of a game dev team who was relatively well equipped making like a unity asset flip with pokemon in it claiming that they are scrappier and more independent than they actually are well, their last game, I can't remember what it was called, but um, it was also an open world survival crafting game. Uh, it was very heavily, obviously inspired by Tears of the Kingdom. Um, yes, because incredibly so. It, it looks like Tears of the Kingdom. You can build um, like little structures and stuff that do things autonomously like Tears of the Kingdom. And all of the enemies look like Moblins and Bacoblins. And that one didn't do very well. I think that was called Craftopia. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. I think the the, the thing about this was it had that flash in the pan moment of oh wow it's pokemon with guns let's check this out oh my god you can enslave people in the game with your pokeballs as well this is really cool yeah it had a sort of mimetic quality to it that made yes, people talk yeah, about it definitely. yeah i mean pokemon with guns was like sells itself right breath of the wild and tears of the kingdom are good games so you don't need a knockoff that's yeah. low quality of that people but are pokemon just hankering so for good bad. pokemon they'll take yeah. anything yeah exactly exactly that's yeah. why it blew up not just because pokemon's super popular
the thing is, people are really pissed at Craftopia because um, they're not developing Craftopia anymore because now they're developing Power World and it was in early access and a load of people bought it on the understanding it might get better and they just like completely dropped it from what I heard. So uh, expect the same to potentially happen to Power World. There's no reason for them to make it better. But this game has been such a bigger hit, though. I think there's chances that are less likely. Yeah, but they've got the money now. They don't They don't need to keep developing it. That's super cynical. I think, why kill the golden goose you know you don't right, what, what they, yeah. what's the next thing they're gonna make that is the next big thing i can't see them making another game that like hits this like level of i will never understand the general public's appetite insatiable appetite for endless crafting survival games that all look the same that all look like they're made out of the same unreal engine 4 asset packs uh, as someone who's not really played much survival open world crafting since minecraft when i was like 17 years old uh, i've i've quite enjoyed power world i think if i just finished like playing through rust i'd probably like be really bored of uh, of power world but power world's good it's fun to explore the world it's fun to catch new pals there are some genuinely interesting things you can do with it um the upgrade system for the pals is quite nice uh it's got some really funny stuff like pals all have special abilities that you can kind of get special crafted harnesses and things for them there's one that just made me chuckle when i started uh, you can get an upgrade that turns one of the foxes that looks like a vulpix into a flamethrower and what happens is it's called like burning hug or something is the ability you just activate it and you pick up the fox and squeeze it so that it spews fire like a flamethrower so and you can like you can just aim it like a like a third person shooter it's really funny um there's one called Pengullet's Rocket Launcher. Uh, when you unlock that, you assume it's going to give a rocket launcher to the Pengullet. What actually happens is you pull a rocket launcher out, put the penguin in the rocket launcher, and fire the penguin at the enemies. It does shitloads of damage, and the penguin gets immediately knocked out. <laughs> I like the uh, there's a there's a pal called Depressor. Yes, and uh, you can force your pals to work for you, and when you make Depresso mine, it very lackadaisically mines its little rock, which I think is a very funny animation. I love Depresso. Depresso also uh, works better at night, so it sleeps during the day and then gets like really pumped to work at night um, if you allow it to. Same. Its like ability is called caffeine high or something that just like generates more more sort of st it's like a haste buff for it um, after it drinks a coffee. There's a lot of funny stuff that goes on in it, and I think the devs' idea was what if Pokemon, but in the real world, because people would just force them to do like labor and stuff like that really so that's kind of where they were going with it like what if it was in a real world where there are guns people would just try and enslave them and and sort of shoot each other and stuff and it's it's kind of interesting yeah, i think i saw a 2004 newgrounds cartoon with that premise once <laughs> yeah but now you can play it Part of the reason we wanted to talk about Power World, I think, was because there's some suggestion that it might have AI art assets in it. I think the hardcore Pokemon fans were looking for anything to... Uh, to discredit it. Discredit it, and they latched on to... They used AI to make the Pals, which doesn't make any sense. So then they backtracked it. They used AI to design the Pals at a conceptual phase but they have no evidence of that, so I don't know. There's definitely the case to be made that there are design motifs from original Pokemon that are in PALS. Whether that's rip-off inspiration or whatever, that's up to you. But uh, let's talk about AI, because AI art is a big thing now. Uh, what do you guys think of AI in oh, art? Damn, we Getting through so many hot button issues right now, aren't we? I like the ability that I can generate an image on my computer and I can use it as part of a project that I'm working on. Um, I've used AI for a number of videos I've made uh, to generate pictures like the the cheese boats and the, the baguette trains <laughs> that went into our um, Smash Bros commentary video. I used it to make the little logo that I put on um, Moogle's mug, the Senatus Post Romanus one. And like... I so I've been thinking about this a lot recently and I I thought 3D modeling wise 
I like 3D modeling and I like making 3D models. And if I could just type into a computer what I want it to make, that wouldn't be very satisfying for me. So I can see the the sort of the appeal of obviously doing your own art. Um, and I might come up with the same outcome, but I wouldn't feel like I'd earned it. But for things that I know I don't really care and I, I wouldn't sort of get much enjoyment out of making, I'm quite happy to generate art for those. That's what I'd say. Commercially is a different question. Artists on the X, they say that the way that AI art generators work is they scrape websites like Pixar and whatever so that they can create a database of stolen artwork that they then use to create the images and that's their argument there. Yeah, well, my brain also does that when I scroll through Pixiv, and if I wanted to become an artist, then I would draw pictures based on pictures that I've seen because then I would have some kind of point of reference. So A lot of this comes down to the use of the phrase artificial intelligence to describe what these programs do, which isn't really accurate. Right, yeah, agreed. Um, it's not really intelligence. It doesn't really learn. All it does is reproduce patterns that it's seen before. And in fact, there was a study done, it was a couple of years ago now, but it was a study shown basically that in over half of the prompts given to something like GPT-3, it creates sentences that are 99 or 98% similar to uh, sentences that are just in its database of scraped things. The AI isn't really thinking and it's not really learning. It's just reproducing things it's already seen before. And that's quantitatively different to what a human brain does. I think my, my, my biggest concern with all this is like misinformation mm. that's gonna be bad it's gonna be so bad we were just talking about like the willy wonka thing you know using like ai art to you know mislead people and you know don't get me wrong i i love a good video of biden and trump playing melee and getting angry at each other damn it why do i fly so far i told you joseph peach you is low tier garbage no he's not yes he is he literally hurts himself but like reproducing people's voices to spread like misinformation to people who aren't as like in the know as we are like is incredibly concerning to me and i really worry about like the repercussions for that to give an example of something that recently happened i can't remember which state in america it was but um there was a phone call that went out to over a thousand houses um in one state in america of an ai generated joe biden voice saying don't go out and vote in the primaries you need to save your vote it's more important that you vote sort of later when we're doing kind of the the proper vote and obviously people would have been like, well, mo the majority of people would have been like, this is a hoax because Biden wouldn't call me to say this. Um, and it was clearly like a, a message that had been recorded rather than someone you could talk to. But there's going to be people who kind of don't understand technology as well or just generally aren't as smart or don't question things as much and get tricked by that yeah. and like moving on from there there's going to be cases where you could get a load of data from someone you know um like i've got hundreds of files of your voices so if i wanted to i could like get moogle's voice and generate him saying something on the fly down the phone to say i don't know his mum and get her to transfer money to a bank account because you know you, that's something you could do there's going to be already cases happened in yeah some yeah places. It's, it's definitely something that's uh, also moogle i wouldn't do that but uh you know just saying i could he says that <laughs> but we know he's thinking about it if you don't paint your little men you know what's going to happen <laughs> i won't paint my little men but i'll make an a i'll make it look like i have by getting an ai to generate photographs of my little men being painted <laughs> damn you've got me there uh, yeah, we're entering the age of misinformation. Like, we were already there, but now it's going to be a lot worse. This is going to, like, really ramp it up. I have more problems as well. I have the problem that uh, we're automating things that are fun and fulfilling for people to do, while all the things that people currently do are miserable and soul-destroying and haven't been automated. And why are we automating these things instead of those things? And I also have the problem that the entire internet is filling up with AI generated shit. There is a lot of it, even on Google Image Search. But my flip side is, I think it's really funny looking on X and seeing people, um, AI artists, I'm using quotation marks, where they describe how difficult it is to get the right image and you have to type <laughs> a certain phrase and it can take hours to, to make the right phrase. So I think it's really funny than that. The other hand is, 
I've tried to commission artists um, before, and uh, number one, it's really expensive, like a hundred dollars ish. It takes a lot longer. It takes a long time. Yeah, I don't have either of those things, so I'd rather have specs make me my thumbnails. Especially when uh, they get the, uh, the the host company to sue you at the end of yes, it. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. The last time I tried to commission artwork as well, uh, it I made my uh, my budding YouTube pro wrestling uh, career go down the toilet, and I had to restart from scratch. The sort of Damocles always over my head. Yeah, that sucked. I will say a couple of things for... Um for AI related art. One of my favorite interactions between AI art and, and real people has been someone tweeted Harada, who's the director of the Tekken series, some AI generated art, which was, it was, I think it was borderline porn, but not quite porn. And he just said, AI generated bullshit, go away and get some real art, um, which was nice. <laughs> Hell um, yeah. And then, so I used AI art in one particular instance, and it's relevant because Specs mentioned my little men. I generated an image using AI art of like I think it was like a phoenix like uh in in the sky behind like a set in front of a setting sun and I freehanded that onto a banner and I wouldn't have had that image if I didn't have AI art so I used it to generate an image which I then painted onto something else completely separately and that was nice uh, also, Rishi Sunak with the Pikachu is an excellent image, and we should find a way to get it into this. <laughs> I like the cheese boats. Oh, the cheese boats. Rishi squeezing the Pikachu is such a funny image. And I think that's that's good. Like, it's it can, it's really good for comedy. It's really good to just, like, generate something to show your friends and be like, look at this, isn't this funny? Yeah, I mm. like an AI-generated shit post. Yeah. I'm also, I'm probably going to be using AI to generate, like, character portraits for my D&D campaigns mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah, it's really good for that. It's really useful for, like, really, like, I don't know, like, quick and dirty, like, like references, like you said, or, like, like mm -hmm. logos that don't mean much, like, stuff like that. Yeah, and, like, stock photography and things like that. Like, a, yeah. a, like a lot of things where the, the purpose of the thing is functional, I don't care. But if I was going to, like, download an indie game on steam and i learned that they'd like generated all of their characters and backgrounds from ai i'd be like well what's the fucking point then well i think steam made it so that you can't do that anymore they, they have relaxed that recently oh, okay. they have relaxed that uh they haven't gotten rid of it completely but there are circumstances where you can use ai generated things but it's like you know that's not the reason that i enjoy looking at things people have made I think there are cases for it, like, if you've got a procedurally generated game in general, and you've got, like, yeah, when you generate a brand new character using the character creator, it generates you a portrait from AIR, I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe, but generally, commercial use of this stuff is, like, it... it it rubs me wrong. I don't yeah. know where it's come from. I don't know whose art it's stolen, effectively. And like I say, it, it's mostly just reproductions of things that people have posted on ArtStation. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's difficult to, to kind of justify it commercially, I think, when you're effectively... You've taken someone's art, they probably didn't consent to it directly mm -hmm. and you've just you've just used it without paying them for it i think it's really useful like we mentioned reference images i think that's really useful for people who maybe aren't as good at art or maybe just need an idea of something who are going to make stuff themselves um so i can definitely see me like generating stuff um as you know make me a 3d model of this thing in this style and then be like right now i can 3d model that now that i have an idea of it in my head because i'm not great at sort of spatial kind of understanding of proportions and stuff like that which i think is is good and like moogle said he's drawn his own art but he needed to be able to see it to draw it um, and that's just like taking a reference image like artists have always done for anything with sort of little models or or sort of the landscapes you know you're painting something that already exists that you can see in front of yourself it makes things a lot easier but i don't think that people should be like hiring prompt artists instead of <laughs> artist yes, artists yeah. Uh, nobody should be getting paid for that shit. Yeah, there is some... What What was the company that recently sacked a load of... Oh, it was like a gacha games company that sacked a load of artists and then posted a job listing for a so-called Photoshop expert. And the reading between the lines was that they were going to generate all of their art by AI and then use Photoshop to like fix all the fucked up fingers and weird perspective stuff. The other thing that really fucks me off 
is uh, AI getting inserted into everything. Like, I haven't upgraded to Windows 11, but I've used a couple of computers that have. Ooh, let's go. Do you want to use AI for this? Do you want to use AI to search your computer? Do you want to use Microsoft Copilot AI to find Microsoft Paint? I, I'm, a, I'm a heavy GitHub user, and every fucking github repository is a stupid little notification thing on it that says you know you can code 43 percent faster with github copilot fuck off i just want to use my thing microsoft i don't care it's not making the experience of using my computer any less displeasurable than it already is please look forward to buying a new cpu in a few years and being forced to have included in it a part of the core for ai and you won't be able to buy one without it, and it'll just add to the money that you're spending without meaningfully giving you something that you care about. Um, coming back to who it may have been that did this, it looks like a developer called Rayark has been accused of laying off all its artists and replacing them with AI um, prompt writers. Uh... Speaking of coming, I don't <laughs> mind the AI-generated hentai if you have a specific niche and fetish hentai uh, AI-generated <laughs> artwork. No, you need to pay artists for that. That's All that's keeping the, the artists afloat is the furry commission. Sure, sure, sure. Whatever. I, I've, I've read, I've read the decades old uh, doujins now the the pages are all crusty <laughs> He's read i need every new one of them. ai generated hentai i'm also very interested in the ai that is decensoring jav movies i think that's really it gets a little <laughs> iffy with foreskins but other than that it's nice to not watch a jav and then think i'm looking at like a crime scene with all the pixelated stuff that's going on so it's that's yeah. nice Unfortunately, it looks like the person who was developing the AI for that uh, was arrested in Japan. Unfortunately. Because, of course, oh, they were. Oh, the Nintendo thing. Yeah, Nintendo came. And Nintendo came. They came. <laughs> but then they then they went over and arrested him and said, you can't decensor this uh, pornography. You're not consuming this pornography in a Nintendo-approved way. How dare you remove this little black bar on this on this penis? How dare you? The thing is, I, I do like the idea that like it depends what percentage of pornography is made as a commodity versus what percentage pornography is made as true genuine art because <laughs> it could be argued that you know some artists are out there you know uh fucking drawing pornography to make a living because it's like a consistent source of income and if you freed them up they would be able to pursue their artistic dreams but it's like if you replace them with ai are they any freer to pursue pursue their artistic dreams not really the hentai artists who work for commission they're technically they're, they're not usually drawing art or hentai that they want to make or find attractive yeah, it's all yeah. commissioned by by furries and scat artists or whatever that maybe make stuff that they don't particularly find attractive i have no problem with them being automated but then it doesn't really help them you know they're still living in the same nightmare world they were before they just can't fall back on drawing a picture of falco lombardi fucking a building to pay this month's rent <laughs> i find it really funny on ex hentai where i see like ai generated artist archives i could not tell you the difference between those ai artists they label them this this artist this art was made by such and such like it's identical to the other ai artist dumps that are on that website on the plus side the furries are they control all of it in the west right they can't control ai art because it fucks up with fur so <laughs> if you if you don't want furry art <laughs> They're in the positions to make all the decisions. If they want to destroy AI art because it's corrupting the, the purity of their own art, then they'll do so, and there's nothing we can do to stop them. Furries being like one plane will fall out of the sky every day and, unless we abolish AI. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a fucking uh, Disney movie with like the forest people, the forest uh, animals <laughs> fighting the mechanical monsters that are creating all these lewd images. You're riding with the Easy Rider. Speaking of cum and other salty uh, products, uh, countries by salt production. We've been waiting to talk about this. Oh, wait, I think we should. I think we might need to push this to next no, podcast. No, no, hold on. No, we can't. <laughs> I have some really important things to say about list of countries by salt production. Are you familiar? Have you read this article before? List of countries no. by salt concentration, uh, salt production. 
The six leading salt producers in the world are China, the United States, India, Germany, Canada, and Australia. And they account for more than half of the worldwide production of salt. Did you know that? I mean, China on its own accounts for nearly a quarter. So a fifth. I'd say it's a fifth. Would anybody like to guess which... Which countries produce the most salt? You you just listed them all. You just you, <laughs> you just, just said, said I can I can see it. Well, would anybody like to guess? China. What you're so <laughs> right. China, US, <laughs> India, Germany, Canada, and Australia. You got all of them, Brandon. You got all of them. I'm so, I'm so talented. No, the more important question is salt per capita. So there's a lot of people in China. So what is the percentage yeah. when you take into account how many extra people there are in China versus the United States, for instance? I bet each Chinese citizen is only getting a little bit of salt. Yeah. Is China like exporting a lot of salt or are they just producing a lot of it? They're hoarding their salt, bastards. It's production. Why is the UK in 12th place? What what business have we producing this much salt? Fish and chips, mate! Uh, excuse me. Yeah, salt is the only British spice. You should know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true! Water! Sorry, What's water? the other spice? <laughs> You get your spam fritter and you just sprinkle a little bit of salt on it. A little bit of cheeky salt. Is gravy a spice? It's not a spice, it's a hot sauce. Careful with that salt, mate. You're going to make my spam fritter a little bit spicy. <laughs> I need mild salt. It's the only it's the only spice that maintains the beigeness of the of the food. I reviewed salt for a YouTube channel called Spice Freak back in the day. Did you know that? <laughs> I, was no. salt, I didn't know that. I was an amateur salt reviewer. <laughs> My friend Curran, he uh, he used to be a traveling chili salesman, but he got fired from his job because he uh, he got really passionate in an argument with a customer about which chili was the best. And you're fucking lying. <laughs> This is a this is an AI generated uh, story. He got fired because he couldn't sell any chili in the UK. Nobody bought it. I don't believe that cats would lie like this. I have never told a lie, and I never will. I don't believe that's true. Tell me the name of the channel. I'm gonna look this up on YouTube. Uh, his the name of the channel is Spice Freak. I think. No, no, no. If you go to spicefreak.blog, look. I have just searched Spice Review on YouTube, and the first video is of a man talking about legal highs, <laughs> and the thumbnail image is of him staring directly into the camera while the king from Shrek 2 <laughs> is on the TV screen behind him. Hell yeah. He was dedicated, didn't he? The Spice Review every week. Yeah. I, w I wonder why I should contact him and find out if he's planning to ever resume it. So I, I went to his house and he was like, I'm not sure of your spice tolerance. So he gave me some some salt, salt. to try. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, yep, it's salt. And then he was like, OK, you can have a little bit of my spicy sauce. And he and I what I did, I put it I put a little bit on my finger and I licked it. And I was like, oh, that's not very spicy. And he was like, it's not very spicy now, but you should go and wash your hands. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, you should go and wash your hands. So I went and I gave my hands a quick rinse because I didn't believe him. And then on the way home from his house, my fucking finger that I'd had the, the chili sauce on started hurting so much it oh hurt God. more than anything else has Beautiful. ever hurt me in my life i swear <laughs> to god it felt like i had burned it and all the flesh had melted off and it hurt for 12 hours it hurt wow. so much that i couldn't sleep at night Fuck. i stayed awake the whole night Beautiful. with my whole hand just in a jug of iced water christ he sent me an email like, do you want to come back next week and review some more spices? And I ghosted him. So <laughs> I'm sorry, Karen, if if you stopped reviewing spices because I stopped talking to you. But I had a very good reason. Hurt for 12 hours. He told you to wash your hands. This is on you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm stupid, okay? I thought because my mouth could handle it that my finger would be able to handle it and it couldn't. Here's the thing, though. Every person in China gets 22.7 tons of salt. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what you were calculating during the fucking spice story. That's so much salt! What That's are they gonna do with that? <laughs> what are they gonna do with what, all that what salt? Do with all that salt? What other uses for salt are there? Can they make houses out of it or something? Like an igloo? No, igloos are made of ice. 
Salt salt melts ice, that wouldn't work. Salt bricks, yeah, those are real things. Mine the salt. I don't know, they're probably using it to make the water... The, the water. water. I can't say water without accidentally saying Walter nowadays. <laughs> they're, they're trying to make the water around them more buoyant so they can float little boats on it. Uses for salt. And maybe they have a lot of demons to contend with? You're the expert on salt. You tell us about it. Why am I the expert on salt? You wanted to talk about this for three podcasts. If you just want to talk about it, just so you could tell that story about you getting burned. <laughs> I, I didn't know I was going to tell that story. I just <laughs> wanted to see if we could... Genuinely, I wanted to see in like a weird postmodern experimentation way if we could fill 10 minutes of podcast with just conversation about Of course about we fucking can. production. Who do you think we are? <laughs> yeah, well, it's just an experiment, isn't it? I went to my parents' house and I, I, I acquired one of my mum's cookbooks, which is uh, Uses for Vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most British fucking thing. It was, it's got a hundred uses for vinegar. If we have time, at the end of this podcast, I will read you some uses for vinegar. Is there, is there a section on ruining chips with it? You are incorrect. Well, all right, you are like, incorrect. A little bit of vinegar is quite good on chips. Hold on, uh, breaking news, I did my calculation the wrong way round. Um, <laughs> every person in China gets 0. 0.04 tons of salt. That's, that's the more reasonable amount of salt. And that's a year. That must be a yearly supply of salt, right? Hold on, every person in the USA gets 0. 0.1 tons of oh, salt per year. China's so, beating us. No, no, oh. you, you you get salt more per salt capita. per person. Yeah. Your salt per capita is hard higher, Bran. You get more salt. You get almost three times as much salt as a Chinese person. Give me the salt. <laughs> Give me the salt. I'm presume I'm presuming the the good people of China consume their salt in a form of soy sauce rather than just eating the salt. The the better question is, uh, no, soy sauce is mainly M MSG, which I don't think it has a lot of salt in it, but you probably need salt to produce it. The better well, question is, has salt in it, who it? has the most salt per capita? Because I bet that's a very different question. And I think the easiest way to research this would actually be to ask Bing Copilot. So I'm going to find <laughs> out if it can tell me. You know, ask Bing Copilot, and then we're going to go with the answer it gives, even if it's wrong, like I did with you presuming that you were a trustworthy source of statistics. What were we talking about before Specs interrupted? Oh yeah, Bran being wrong about vinegar. Also, uh, as I pointed out when we were somewhere in Wales, uh, the vinegar that they use at fish and chip shops isn't actually vinegar, it's a different chemical because vinegar is not kosher. I think they use fake vinegar because it's cheaper. No, it's because it's not kosher. No, the true vinegar is like really is like most of most of the vinegar you buy is in like true vinegar, right? Why would it be in kosher matter? Richard the Lionheart expelled all the Jewish people from England. Because fish and chips is a Jewish dish. I oh, told you this. You're actually you're right. You're right. Fish and chips on a Friday. Fish and chips was introduced by a Jewish population from the Netherlands because you can't eat me on the sabbath it's friday the sabbath i get confused i thought it was saturday pretty sure it's sabbath it's saturday. saturday in in jewish culture it's saturday uh, so we just shifted the day to friday for some reason chippy friday the catholics do it on friday yeah oh of course it's the no it's the catholics who do it on friday of course it's one of their bullshit things but they can eat beaver though you can eat puffin as well beaver is a fish <laughs> yes you can eat beaver you can eat duck on those days because it counts. Could you eat a duck bill platypus? Yes. Capybaras, you can eat capybaras. They're fish as well, according to the Pope. I wouldn't eat a capybara. They're too nice. Would you eat an albatross? I'd eat anything. Even an albatross? Hell yeah. What if it gave you bad luck? And just eat a bunch of rabbits to off offset it. <laughs> you <laughs> you no, you only feet. eat the feet. You don't eat the rest of the rabbit. Yeah, you chomp on their feet like lollipops. <laughs> Okay, so I've I've done the calculate. Well, I haven't done the calculations. I've I've forced I've forced Bing to do it. You've done that thing that everyone does. I've done the calculation. I painted this. Okay, no, I had to I had to finagle it. I'll explain the process. I said I said to it highest salt per capita, and it said consumption China seventeen point seven grams of salt daily. So that's why they produce a lot of salt. They eat a lot of salt. Jesus, <laughs> that's, that's a, a lot, lot of salt. salt. You want to take a guess? Guess which country is second. Ooh, US. You could, you know, you should be able to solve this. It's actually really obvious. <laughs> per capita, Poland, Japan. No, 
No, you're, you're close with Poland. It's Hungary because they're so hungry. Uh, it's 14.3 <laughs> grams of salt per day. Thanks, Professor Layton. So I asked, no, which one has the highest salt production per capita? And it said, I don't have specific figures of that. So I told it, if you divide the amount of salt production by person in each country, then you can use this to calculate it. And it finally gave me the answer I wanted. See, that's what we prompt writers do. You know, <laughs> when you're not getting the answer you want, we know how you're to like caress an interrogator the, for AI the police. Whisperer, the AI whisperer. It's pronounced prompt engineer. This this position should be called AI Wrangler. I'm the AI Wrangler. The answer is Germany. Yeah. Okay. Um, apparently. So Germany is 0.15. That's not that surprising. 0.15 metric tons of salt per person. So it's not much more than the US, which is 0.13. So you're you're probably about second um in the uh in the standings, as long as Bing is telling me the truth and not just picking some countries at random, which it might be. It's on the internet. It has to be true. Uh, but you see, you're, you're not. Germany's not producing that salt. You're eating Chinese salt. You're eating oh, Chinese salt. Fuck. <gasps> I remember back when salt production was all domestic. When people went down to the salt mines and carved it or harvested it from the sea. Nowadays, they just import some cheap Chinese salt. It's not as good. You know, Germany. Germany produces. Um, a fourth, right? a a lot of salt. Yeah, they're fourth in the world. So actually, they may be producing all of the salt that fuels their their people. I guess, <laughs> and that's why angry Germans are a stereotype, right? That's where the salt comes from. Let's find out how much salt each German person eats per day. Let's not. Let's move on. <laughs> I count the grains of sand on the beach. We do our very speedy, quick, fast 2023 video game recap. So the rules are you get one minute on each game. That's it. That's the rules. Oh, and if someone else wants to talk about it, I might extend it to two minutes, but I'll be timing everyone. One minute per game or one minute per person? One minute per game. So how many games could I talk about? You can talk about as many as you like, but but like I'm not expecting everyone to have played like 30 games per year. Are these games that released last year or games we played last year? Games you played last year, preferably games that released last year. I'm going to talk about like four or five games. I, I want to talk about, I talk about Hi-Fi Rush. Hi-Fi Rush was a game that came out and uh, no one, it shadow dropped from an Xbox of it uh, direct. It's a combat game with music in it, uh, but the music is <laughs> <laughs> really hard. It's a rhythm spectacle fighter game where you do your combos in time and rhythm to get more damage and stuff it's great art style great personality uh it's just a shame it released at the very start of the year because by february everyone had forgotten about it but it's really good really fun and it's apparently coming to playstations and switches soon uh, as an xbox exclusive i heard that was a really good game i played it like last month and it was wonderful I played it just because it was on Game Pass and I had nothing else to play. And it's one of the few games I've played start to finish um, in the last couple of years, I can think, without really taking a break to play anything else in between. Like Mitch said, it's a rhythm-based action game. It plays like Devil May Cry, but you have to time your button presses to the music. That includes dodging, that includes jumping, that includes basically anything you're doing. Once you get into the rhythm, it's actually really like fun. You feel really good doing it. Um, you don't have to do everything to the rhythm, um, but you'll do less damage and you get less score. The cast of characters are fun. They're friendly. Um, there's a lot of humor in the game. Uh, like Mitch said, the art style is really good. It looks like you're playing an anime. Uh, and the music's all really good. Um, I'll hand over to Moogle. Uh, you do actually have to do everything to the beat because you only take actions on the beat. So even if you press the button, you don't get the action until the beat occurs, uh, which makes it really interesting. And it's probably the best example of gameplay and art and sound all at once uh like combining together uh the only thing that really compares with it is something like thumper which is like another one of those games which is like really heavily rhythm focused um hi-fi rush is really good people should play it um even if you don't if you like rhythm games but you don't normally like really action focused games you should play it if you play action games but you don't normally like rhythm focused games you should also play it it's one of those types it's really good the writing is really fun and funny uh and really well animated uh, I played it very recently, like a month ago, and I loved it. It's great. Yeah, I should give it a shot. Uh, next one uh, wasn't released in 2023, 
it was released in 2022 on mobile, but it got a PC port in 2023. That's Nikkei, the goddess of victory. Oh, it is a oh, gacha sake. light gun <laughs> game that uses a live 2D art for its girls in it. It is set in a post-apocalypse where an alien race called Ravagers have wiped out most of humanity and driven them underground in a place called the Ark. Oh, this is Bum Game, isn't it? This is the this Bum, is Bum Game, game yes. yeah. Uh, and so in order to combat the the Ravagers, humanity has created Nikkei, which are artificial humans, where they take the brains of women and children and stuff them into these robot bodies. And that has varying varying implications in that they are no longer human, so they have no human rights. Uh, they also can undergo mind wipes and lose their memories and stuff like that. They can also go aberrant and, That's and kill you can humans stop and now, stuff thanks, like Mitch. that. Oh. Maybe, uh, maybe <laughs> I want to let him keep talking so we can talk about bum jiggle. Yeah, can, can we can we let this go on long enough for the for the bum to enter the conversation? Speed up to the bum. Speed up to the bum. I, right? I've not played a, another Getcha game before, but I was driven to this because of the bum jiggles and also because it's a light gun esque game where you sh have a shooting gallery, but but. The story and the characters are so good, and I like them so much. And it really doesn't drive you to spend any money. You can, and it does like do pop ups of like, oh, five ninety nine, and you can get all these gems, so you can do your pulls. I have not really had any impulse to do stuff like that. I get enough gems and free pulls and stuff, and I have my whole team of of busty bunny girls and whatnot on my team right now, and I and I love I love them. They jiggle when I touch them. It's very very good. Okay, it's horny game for horny people. The worst part about this is that I've heard from someone who I trust that the game actually has like a pretty good like dystopian science fiction yeah, yeah, story. Yeah, it does. it, it really just does. also has anime girls with jiggling I've bums in it. I've seen him play it though, and it looks really boring. I've no. seen him play it. It's <laughs> no, not good. The story. The story. Specs tried to play it, but he kept putting his finger on bum. And we, we just don't sure. know why. Yeah, my tasty. finger is magnetized to bum tasty. Eeb, Eeb got a port to the Switch. Uh, it included a new dungeon. Um, it, I was think I thought it was going to have new graphics, uh, like the Yumi Nick Nick Nico Yumi Nicky fight. Uh, re-release but it doesn't it's the same rpg maker art style i was hoping that uh, the eeb port would make more eeb content i've always wanted like an ova or something of eeb but the best i got was a uh nendroid of eeb which i've ordered and it will go next to my um ring what's the girl name of the girl from ring sayako yeah she'll she'll go next to my sayako and they'll they'll have a fun time trying to scare each other uh that's that <laughs> i really like eeb did I the developer ever make anything else i like a game where you go inside a painting it's really good it's really really good it's just like a nice rpg maker ad adventure game yeah. pretty much forget your tekkens and your street fighters and your mortal kombat one screw all that I'm here to talk about Idol Showdown. Hey, I can talk it about this one too. It is a free fighting game that is based on the uh, characters of Hololive, the VTubing company. Oh, so God tired. Again. It is really fun to play. Uh, it is an anime style fighter with assists and whatnot. It has a story mode, some uh, official voice acting by one of the girls. Actually, a couple of the girls, they redo their own lines. Uh, the art style is a little rough. It's very pixely when you compare it to stuff like Arc System has been doing in the 2D fighter space, but it's really fun and it's a really well po polished fighting game for free. We spent like three hours playing this. Like on one day, didn't we, Mitch? It's actually pretty fun um, for a fighting game. Yeah, uh, I, I don't have too much to say about it other than the people that make it obviously know their their core kind of like the the audience. They understand the memes that go with um, all of the people concerned. Like the fighters are all oh, different. Yeah, a lot of references. Uh, I I enjoyed playing the 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 grappler. Like I don't normally play the grappler. I played the grappler. She was fun. Um, Mitch didn't like it very much. Uh, <laughs> Next, AEW Fight Forever! Fight Forever! 
as is tradition, if you are a wrestling company that makes it big, you need to have your obligatory wrestling game. And AEW Fight Forever is the fighting wrestling game for uh, All Elite Wrestling. Oh, this looks dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> it does look shit, I admit. It is purported to be directed by the director of the Aki Corporation, who did a lot of the uh, old school N64 PlayStation 1 wrestling games that were held in high regard. It does have that sort of DNA in it. The only issue is that it is very content light in terms of uh, character creation. There's You can barely make a good uh, custom character when the whole enjoyment of a wrestling game is making a custom character from a company that is not represented. The story mode is a little iffy. The finale of the game, you fight a shadow clone of yourself to like in like a... a it's very GWA wrestling shadow dom. You have to fight your shadow persona style in order to like come to terms with something about your yourself. This has mostly negative reviews on Steam. <laughs> it's got yeah. a People saying that it has like $30 worth of DLC up front when you've already bought the game that yeah. has all the things that you want in it. Okay, here's my question for you. Would you buy another AEW Fight Forever? If they bring out Fight Forever 2 next year, would you buy it? Yeah, I would, because I'm a mark like that. <laughs> if it had like, the stuff I, I wanted, like the new wrestlers that I want, and the new, and like a story mode creator and more stuff yeah i'd buy it my friendly neighborhood shut up about resident evils and your shit like that i know there's a bit of a problem with like um your puppy playtimes and your stuff like that mascot horror is what they're known as but and my friendly neighborhood is like sesame street if it was resident evil but it is a very competent resident evil four slash seven first person uh clone it is very charming it's very nice and it's got good puzzles and it's got nice combat and nice thinking you have to think about how you traverse your environments because the puppets when you shoot them with your gun that fires letters at them they get back up when you come back into the room and of course your items and resources are going away it has the re4 cachet case so you do your little puzzle there there's limited amounts of saves and there's multiple endings, and it's nice to look at. It's This is the first game these people have ever done, but it's made by the Szymanski brothers. This isn't the person who made it, but they are related to the person who made Iron Lung and stuff like that, those games. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I like puppets, and I like Resident Evil, so this is a demo on Steam as well, so... I watched Mitch play this. It was it was pretty fun. It looked, it looked pretty good. Like, well thought through, polished enough. Yeah, yeah. Weird game development family. Dynasty, even. It released a free DLC, which was uh, like a horde mode with multiple characters and stuff like that. It's fun. It's good. My last game that I'm going to talk about is Ridge Racer R4, the PlayStation 1 game. It Hell is yeah, motherfucker. incredible in amazing. The art style is so good. It definitely persona took inspiration from this it's bold yellow and black there's a story mode for every single difficulty with a different uh company and you work through your manager's problems if you race to the new year the final race takes place on new year's eve 1999 you're racing for the millennium my reason to buy this and play this on an actual PlayStation 1 is I bought the JogCon and the hey, NegCon, which yeah, are dude. the official peripherals for Ridge Racer R4. The NegCon, it has a, like a twisty bit in the middle. You twist the controller and it turns your car. The JogCon has a little dial in the middle of its controller, which you use as a steering wheel. It has force feedback built within it, and you can feel your car turn as you as you bank into corners such good music uh such good such good much art style so good you can see like the trails of your brake lights uh akira oh, I like uh, lines as you go into tunnels it's just really good you're right i should play this fucking game it's been on my list for years it's actually surprisingly deep because it takes every result in the in the like the racing campaign that you do and it will give you a new car based on your previous results so if you constantly get at just the level to progress to the next stage it will keep your car but upgrade its 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 stats if you want like the really interesting cars you have to win 
every single race in succession, which is harder than it would first appear. Also, the storylines are completely different from all the other characters, and the characters are surprisingly fleshed out as actual real people with their own motivations. It's it's not what I expected from like an arcade racing game released in the late 90s. It's very strange, uh, but it's really well worth playing. There's 380 cars in the game that you can unlock. Damn, that's a lot. Yeah. Each car is a combination of different race results if that makes sense so yeah, yeah. like if you were to get like the highest possible on the first race and then the middle of the second you get a completely different set of cars from if you're for if you're second place then first place it's it's really weird um and the racing feels really good like going sideways around corners it's probably the best going sideways around corners game i'm gonna take over because the first time i think mitch ever used this controller was he was visiting me at my house and we went to the um the computer museum in leicester um so that he could plug in his special peripheral and play some racing games on the playstation that they had set up there oh that's cool and yeah it looked kind of cool uh, i also want to say that i had a dream the other day that i was driving a bus um and i w had to i was still sat at the back of the bus um but had a big steering wheel so it was really hard to drive because obviously i was so far back it was hard to make adjustments so they said oh come to the front and then I had to drive the bus with a very similar peripheral to what Mitch has just described, <laughs> where I had to twist a little knob uh, left and right like I was cracking a safe in order to st steer the bus. Um, and uh, this was like two days ago, so kind of relevant. Maybe my dreams are predicting Mitch's taste in video games or something. Did you do it? Did you save all those people? Uh, I think I think we managed to get to where we were going without crashing, which is strange because usually I crash cars in <laughs> Dreams. <laughs> and say, in real life. And in real life. <laughs> I didn't play a ton of new games last year, but I've got a couple I want to talk about. And my favorite game that I played last year, I guess. think, was Pizza, Pizza Tower. Tower. Hey, it's yeah. really good. Okay. Oh. It's so good. So the thing is that, like, I actually I bounced off of Beast of Tower a couple times because the the first pl the first playthrough is not that great because the game like feels best when you're going fast and yeah. you, when you don't know the levels, you just kind of get hit a lot and yeah. it doesn't feel that great. It feels really weird at first, and you get like yeah. caught on walls and accidentally end up running up them when you don't yeah. want to and yeah. stuff like that. This is a game that I feel like. It is, it is best played if you want to do everything. And I did all the P ranks and I had so much fun learning every level and developing strategies. And when I just got that perfect run, like nothing compared to that feeling for me last year. Love the art style, love the animation, love the humor. The soundtrack is incredible. Yeah, it's really good. All that is really good. Yeah, it's such a fucking fun game. So I really liked Peter Tower. I really liked the movement and all that. I think... I was a little less hot on it because um, I was looking for something more like Warrior Land 3 or 4, and it's just not that game. Like, there's no exploration, there's no puzzle solving, uh, there's nothing like that. It's all based around movement and platforming and speedrunning, and that element of the game is good, but I'm, I still have like a little Warrior Land fill void in my heart. I've only played Warland 3. I haven't played 4, and I want to get to it. Um, but it's very different from 3, because yeah. 3 is way slower yeah, yeah. and mm. more um, like puzzly. There's no, there's really theory. no puzzly, puzzling in Pizza Tower. But Pizza Tower still has my recommendation. It's really funny. It's a funny-ass game. It's a funny fucking game, yeah. Also, Gustavo kind of sucks. Hey, you take that back. I won't. Y'all know me. I'm the Pikmin guy. I'm going to talk about <laughs> Pikmin 4. <laughs> That's fair enough. Pikmin 4 is a game that I've always wanted. It's basically the game I've always wanted. If Pikmin 3 was Pikmin 1, 2, Pikmin 4 is Pikmin 2, 2, and I love Pikmin 2. Pikmin 4 is long. It has tons of content, and pretty much all of it is really, really good. I do kind of miss some of the more like um, multitasking elements that 3 had. You can't really multitask as effectively in 4 because you kind of need to keep Ochi and your captain together. But it is like a near perfect Pikmin experience and I never thought I would have something that like made me feel like playing, made me feel like I was playing two again, but they gave it to me. The upgrade system is cool because there's a lot, there's a lot of options which will also allow me to do cool challenge runs in the future with limiting myself. It is definitely on the easy side, which is to be expected of a modern Nintendo game. But like, I do miss like some of like the, uh, bullshit from two, but um, 
it's fucking great and i never thought i would get a game i never thought i'd get four i'd given up on it yeah i kind of i i bounced off three i didn't bounce off three like i finished three but i was left unsatisfied by three and i think that's because like you said three is so similar to one and two is is quite different and because this is more similar to two like you've got dungeons under the ground and um sort of the the flow will be slightly different because of that uh i think really i would really enjoy this and i need to get on it but also i think i might just wait until uh until i can easily obtain it without giving nintendo any money you know (laughs) that's illegal you can't do that I am sending Hitmen to your house. Oh, I meant I'd buy it second hand, of course. <laughs> I am sending Hitmen to your house. It's illegal to buy games second hand. If Nintendo could ban that, they would. What's the control scheme like? Because I like pick my Pikmin via new play control Wii style. Does the Switch allow you it's to aim like that? Oh, okay. No, unfortunately. It's kind of like an auto lock on feature, which is kind of annoying. Oh, yeah, it is annoying. Yeah, I, I do wish, like, I know 3 had a, on Switch had like a kind of shitty version of the those play controls where they keep resyncing. Uh, 4 just gets rid of that and basically just auto locks on to everything for you and you can switch between lock-ons with like the the trigger buttons. It's upsetting because I played the demo and uh, it's like they've t- they've lowered the the skill ceiling and floor really. It's like I, yeah. it used to be if you chucked your Pikmin on a Bulborg straight like and it landed straight on top, you'd get a free kill and now that just happens. Yeah, that, I do miss that. Um I, I definitely think both one and two, one, two, and even three have like higher skill ceilings, which I do miss. But I guess I just, I just love Pikmin so much that like I was just happy to get something. This is not a game I played last. Yeah, not a game that came out last year, but I played Amori last year, and that game left a pretty strong impact on me. It's kind of your classic mother-like in the sense that it's not actually that fun to play, but it has great message and great characters and a pretty good aesthetic. Uh, the hand-drawn stuff for the cutscenes and the battles are wonderful, but the overworld leaves a bit to be desired. But I don't want to say too much about it because of spoilers, but um, the ending is, like runs the gambit of emotions. I don't think I've ever had a game with such a shitty ending still make me feel like kind of good. <laughs> That's all I'll really say about it. The Mario Wonder last year. Mario Wonder is good fun. It's fine. It hasn't left as much of an impact as I thought it would. Like, I've enjoyed it a lot in the moment, but looking back on it, like, I don't, like, remember a lot of it. I love, like, the aesthetic. It is so good to have a Mario game that actually has a personality and a direction that isn't just, like, soulless, bland plastic. I mean, a 2D one, like, you know, Odyssey is obviously gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But no, I agree with you. I feel like most of my enjoyment of this game is just because I've been so, like, soured on, like, 10 years of New Soup. Yeah. Like, I think if you take away that context of the fact that 2D Mario has been bland and soulless, this game is just fine. It's definitely no Tropical John. Mm. It's it's clearly Nintendo trying to tap into that creativity that went into Tropical John. I don't think it necessarily holistically combines together quite in the really elegant way no, that Tropical John does. Yeah, no. yeah, I agree. As someone who plays a lot of Kaizo Mario, it feels like it's it's made by people who have been playing or looking at a lot of uh, Mario World ROM hacks. Yeah, it just, I'd it's agree. Got that vibe it has me. that hectic wait, 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 feel. Wait, 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 though. Nintendo <laughs> wouldn't allow their own staff to look at Kaizo Mario. That's why they made You're Mario talking about Maker. Super Mario Maker levels. Of course, of course. I better preface this in the way that Games Done Quick do. Uh, Super Mario World fan games, not ROM hacks. The fan games. That's even worse. Yeah, they don't like, they don't like those either. Illegal, illegal, illegal. illegal. Uh, yeah, I, I like Wonder. I think it's got lots of really interesting ideas in terms of things like my favorite things about the game were actually the, the, the bite size challenges, like mm-hmm. the challenges for the badges that you got and stuff I like the that. Challenges, I thought yeah. they were really fun because each one just has one unique twist on the platforming and it's like a one minute really hard level. If anything, I wish there were more of that. Although the regular levels were fun too. I played a bit of this at Moogle's house. I haven't played most of the game. We played maybe like a world's worth of content. Yeah, thereabouts. I do like that they give you here is the challenge to learn how to use this badge but not just those but every level felt really 
short, I think, to me. Yes, I agree. It feels like just when a concept is going for each level um, and it really starts to feel like, yeah, I'm getting this, this is a cool concept, the level ends and it's like, oh, okay, uh, guess we're rushing that one out the door to get on to the next one. I absolutely agree. I don't mind that they're short. That's in the tradition of Mario Bros. 3, which did the same thing and was probably the best 2D Mario that they've made still. I think the problem is this one's not hard enough that you like you can complete each level in one go in this so you're not seeing it again and getting used to the concept and things whereas three took a few tries on a lot of levels I would say there's there's a couple of levels especially the the special ones which like I haven't gone through all of yet but I've gone through I think three of them certainly the special levels are a little bit more difficult I don't even think their levels are that hard and there's only there's like six of there's like one per world, and I only ha- I only remember struggling with like two of them. I mean, yeah, if you compare this to like Super Mario World, it's nothing in comparison. Yeah. That said, I don't think 2D Mario is obliged to be super difficult. No. If you want that, go play the Mario Maker hard levels. It's fine. I wasn't even looking for difficulty. I was just looking. I would have liked the levels to be longer because, like, yeah. Trop- when I look at Tropical Freeze, like they really take an idea and they run with it and really expand on it throughout a pretty lengthy level but i agree with specs in the sense that every time i played a level in this game i felt like just as i was like oh like they're getting somewhere with this and then the wonder gimmick happens which is fun and then it ends yeah the wonder gimmicks are a bit some of them are fine some of them are like oh we're in slow motion i was like oh, i don't care some of them are pretty throwaway all right i'm gonna speed through all of mine as fast as i can I played Corn Kid 64, which is a 3D platformer from the makers of Lyle in Cube Sector from like 2004. Um, it's got really fun, unique platforming gameplay based around chaining together wall jumps and dashes. It kind of feels like a 3D version of Celeste in a way, but I prefer it in the framework of like an exploratory platformer. Um, but what made the game for me was like, it has this, the aesthetic sensibilities of like an early aughts Nickelodeon TV show crossed with a Newgrounds cartoon with like tracker music. And it's like, on the one hand, it's like really weird and esoteric. And on the other, it's like fun and cartoony. A lot of throwback 3D platformers just kind of like wallow in past nostalgia without a strong creative voice of their own. But I think this game has that. Um, and I really like it. And also it's only like four or five hours long but it's very cheap on steam so i'd recommend it i recommend silo sybil which is the same thing but instead of an exploratory 3d platformer it's a linear 3d platformer like crash bandicoot but i also played crash bandicoot 4 last year and i thought that game was fucking shit <laughs> it was just annoying and underbaked and over designed but silla sybil is the exact opposite it's really simple and it just focuses on having really intricately designed levels and actually a few people were complaining that like the levels in mario wonder were underbaked and under long then you should play silo sybil because it just has these really complicated intricate levels that really get the most out of unique level mechanics it's cool how do you spell silo sybil it's p s i l o s y b i l i played b3313 which i wasn't expecting to like cuz like haunted mario 64 memes are kind of basic in my eyes. They occupy the same mental space as like Sonic.exe and Five Nights at Freddy's, uh, which is why I was surprised that Beasts 3313 is a really good game. It's genuinely creepy without ever being like over the top and silly. It's also just often sort of dreamlike and surreal, and it mixes its moods in almost the exact same way as something like um yume niki does and actually has a really similar core conceit to yume niki just like exploring endlessly this you know space that seems to go on forever with all of these doors and all these passages and chambers and trying to work out how to progress through it and and how to make progress it's cool i've read up a little bit on this i haven't actually played any of it or watched much footage it you start off in proper mario 64 but then like you end up finding that there are more portraits than there should be or they take yeah. you to different places right and there's a lot of beta assets i think that have been yeah. recreated do you think it would work in multiplayer and we could all just follow each other around and explore like as a group because i was thinking about 
trying this at some point and uh, it might be fun. I don't know if you can play it in multiplayer, but if you could, I, it'd probably be fun. But honestly, I would also just play it by yourself because it's fun to just like zone out and explore all these like weird ass dream worlds. I played Turbo Overkill, which I'll mostly gloss over. But um, so you know how I always complain about Doom 2016 being boring and crap? Yes. <laughs> Turbo Overkill is a game made in the style of Doom 2016, but um, instead of like locking you into like these annoying glory kill animations, um, it gives you like this really versatile, expressive movement system and all of these cool mechanics that let you kill enemies, kill enemies in like a variety of ways. Um, and it, it's basically yeah, it's just Doom 2016, but good. I find the whole like 80s neon cyberpunk aesthetic is kind of played out. I don't really care for that, but the core gameplay is good if you want like a Doom style, a, a new Doom style shooter. Um, I played Anthology of the Killer, which I will never stop shilling because it's made by the Catamites who developed Space Funeral. It's it's just Space Funeral's like spiritual successor. You know, Space Funeral was like a satire of role playing games. Anthology of the Killer is a satire of a lot of stuff. It's just as funny and and crude as Space Funeral, but it's even more aggressively postmodern. And like in an age of really really bland, boring video game writing, I genuinely I think the Catamites is one of the strongest creative voices out there. Um, and it's just a joy to like walk around and hear all the weird dialogue in that game and see all the funny ideas um it's free it's episodic it's mostly just like a point and click adventure game with simple puzzles and, and dialogue but uh it's definitely worth it and each episode takes like half an hour to complete so if you have half an hour free please please go play it i played slayers x which is a retro FPS in the style of build engine games developed by a fictional teenager from the year 2005 or so. Um, and if you were a teenager in the mid aughts and you lived in a shitty town and listened to like new metal and thought you're a super cool, super deep person, um, then this game is made for you. You will spiritually bond with it. Like it's calling you out, but it's also a sincere, I guess, celebration of the innocence of that time and like that aesthetic that fucking nobody on earth is nostalgic for yet also if you like build engine games then this is a genuinely good build engine game uh when most build style fps games are a bunch of shit looking at the a screenshot on steam you seek to poop in me thou art a fool zane the whole game is like that beautiful let's let's do the one that specs and i can fall over for a little bit played the lies of p last year yes didn't think it didn't think i was going to enjoy it that much i thought it was going to be a uh a fairly soulless rip-off of uh, a From Software game. Soulless. <laughs> um, and I ended up really, really enjoying it. Um, and I think it's probably better than almost everything that From Software have made while being in the same kind of space. Yeah, it was really fun. Great art style. Um, kind of like Bioshock-ish in its aesthetic, I guess, where you've got um, this um, like steampunkish yeah, it's sort of steampunky world it lives in. You've got like puppets everywhere, and it's uh, the combat's really good. Um, it's uh, it, it it features uh, parrying systems, which everyone loves. Parrying systems, like I really like that. It's got some interesting movement stuff. Um, yeah, fun times. Uh, I better much better than I expected. Yeah, I uh, I really enjoyed this. It probably my game of the year last year. It's the best Souls game I've played, and I've played basically all of them except Demon Souls and Elden Ring. Um, it uh, what what's good about it is it really rewards you for aggressive play. So the parry system, it's kind of like Punch Out. I mean, it's it's basically based on Sekiro. You can parry any attack pretty much that an enemy does. Um, you can also just block them but you take damage while you're blocking whereas parrying will stagger them more quickly so it allows you to play more aggressively there's magic systems involved and um, you can just dodge attacks as well but you don't get the damage output you would um, if you're parrying there's lots of different build variety I've only played it through once but I could definitely see myself going back to it in a year or so I really like the setting as well I don't usually like steampunk but I think wrapping the story of Pinocchio it up in this way it's interesting if you re 
read a bit of the original Pinocchio and being like, oh, I see why that's like this in this game. Like the bosses are all based on characters from the original story. Um, there's some really interesting stuff. Like in the original Pinocchio, Pinocchio gets hung from a tree by um, t- like four rabbits and then they stick him in a coffin. And there's a boss fight where you're fighting like four rabbits who are trying to put him in a coffin, for instance. I mean, it's not, not that deep, but it's just interesting to see they have kind of taken elements from that work and run with it. It's uh, it's a good game. I like it. I just want to annoy Mitch by saying I played a lot of Resident Evil 4 and it was really good. The remake came out last year and it's it's really good. I'll play it eventually. I don't mind. It's, I, I'm more just annoying you by the fact that Resident Evil 3's remake was absolute garbage. Oh well, yeah, it had to be so that you could get to RE4 quick enough. Exactly. Keep going because this is eating up your time. Yeah, I know. Resident Evil 4, um, <laughs> Resident Evil 4 original is like the iconic third person shooter that kicked off all of the other ones that came after it and they were all trying to ape it. Um, it removes almost all the QTEs in the game. Um, like you haven't got those segments anymore where you just mash on buttons um, for the most part. Um, I, ca- I I enjoyed the base kind of like shooting enough to play it through so that I platinumed it. So all the achievements and stuff. Uh, all the difficulties, speed running, all that good stuff. Um, it's a really, really solid third-person shooter. It's still got enough of the personality of the base game while clearing up some of the rougher edges. Um, it's still uh, the ambience is really good. Um, it still feels really creepy at times. Yeah, it's really good. I can recommend it as like a triple A release. Here's a question though: uh, Four still holds up. Like I played Four last year or maybe the year before because me and Shiny were slowly going through all the Resident Evil titles and 4 still holds up what does this do to make it better or worse like in comparison makes it look nicer and it's more serious and adult there's an element of that um i mean to an extent you don't really have to play it if you enjoy the original there are some some nice parts to it the shooting does feel better i will i will give them that the shooting does feel a lot better in the new one um it does it takes a lot from the other remakes so resident evil 2 and 3 uh in regards to its movement which in some ways i like because it makes it more tense because you cannot just stop on a dime and turn around and run away um at the same time I, I like that about Resident Evil 4, so it doesn't invalidate the original for me. I have reasons to go back and play both. Like, I, en- I enjoy both of them. You could say it's a remake that doesn't really need to exist because the original is still good. Yeah. I, don't, I don't mind the fact that they've done it. It brings enough to the table on its own. Uh, it does also does a lot more with the characterization of especially of some of the side characters in the game. And I think that that's a that's a solid thing that it's done as well. Like Luis in particular, like was kind of a nothing in the original game, and he has a lot more of a of of theme theming and uh, a personality going on in this one. Luis. Louis. Louis. Uh, I played through Final Fantasy 16, uh, and I won't talk about it for too long, I might not even take up a minute. Um, really bizarre video game, like, AAA, obviously, like, AAA um, production quality has gone into it. Like, stunning soundtrack, graphically amazing, all the rest of the stuff. Um, then uses random, like, progression systems from MMOs, because it was directed by their main MMO person, who, in fairness, is printing money for them, so I understand why they've done it. It leads to a very, like, mangled game where I don't really understand and a lot of the choices they've made. If you do any side quest in the game, it assumes that you've never done any side quests before. So it goes through stuff and it's all kind of like difficulty curved to where you, you're not having any fun with the side quests. They're kind of like just character focused and like story focused. Very bizarre video game and combat directed by the Devil May Cry um, combat director. So it plays well. It's made them no money. I think it's a loss for them overall, given the amount of money they put into it. Just a really bizarre video game overall. Uh, I enjoyed it um, in parts, but I can't honestly recommend it to a lot of people, and a lot of people didn't buy it. So my first game is uh, WarioWare Move It. So um, this is essentially a sequel to WarioWare Smooth Moves on the Wii. If you ever played that, it's all motion control based. Um, I've always wanted a sequel to WarioWare Smooth Moves because I think it was great fun to play with friends and family. Um, It had a pretty good uh, single player mode that took quite a while to work through and it had a lot of fun mini games as well to go alongside it. Uh, WarioWare Move It is a little bit more complex 
complex with the way it wants you to hold the Joy-Cons compared with the Wiimote, and that's because you can do more with the Joy-Con, obviously. So it can be a little bit confusing at first what you need to do in the mini games, but once you've understood them and you've played it a couple of times, they're, they're really quite fun to do. Is it as good as Smooth Moves? It's very difficult to say. I don't think it's got as much content or as much content variety as the original, um, which is uh, a downside. But it's nice to have something fresh and new, and I think the multiplayer modes are actually better in this than in Smooth Moves, but maybe not as good as in, say, the original um, WarioWare Mega Micro Games Inc. on the GameCube. I guess that's not the original, it's the, the sort of first console one. The other thing I think, the, the only other game we've not talked about yet that I wanted to talk about is Furballs Racing. <laughs> oh, oh, we're back on the tier three grind. <laughs> I started looking around for tier 3 racing games on the PC because there aren't any console ones anymore. The new hotness in tier 3 racing is Furballs Racing on Steam. It costs about £5. Um, it's really good. It's got really good movement. I think it does a lot right. Um, the level design is all kind of very basic, boring like Unity sort of store asset stuff. It's all just floating platforms in space. Eye gouging backgrounds. Yeah, yeah some of the, the some of it, it looks horrible. But the way you move is really good good so um you can you can move you can jump you can drift um and you get a boost after drifting but you can drift in the air as well so you can charge up a uh, a boost sort of in the air and then fling yourself off in another direction before you land it's got this little thing where you kind of do like a drop dash in sonic so if you press the boost button just as you touch the ground you can keep your momentum um there's a bit like you can build big momentum off ramps and then jump really really far and skip whole parts of levels there's wall running and sliding there's wall jumps um so if you get good at it it really rewards interesting movement the only problems i'd say with it are one it looks like shit and two the only item in the game is a little poo that you can either throw at other people or you can surround yourself with which slows you down but means you can bash into people and quite often you're not anywhere near anyone so it needs better items really yeah why are you not talking about Mind Jack? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why are you not okay, talking right, about right, Mind Jack? Right, you want to talk about Mind Jack? Oh, my God. So. Okay. So, actually, that's good. That's a good thing you brought up. I was thinking, what other games have I played this year? Mind Jack. So, um, me and Mitch decided to play some old Xbox 360 titles, and he convinced me to play Mind Jack. We did this specifically for your Tier 3 racing thing, because you wanted to play Viva, Viva Piñata. Viva Piñata. Yes, I did. I wanted to play Viva Piñata Travel in Paradise. <laughs> It apparently has tier three elements in it, it does. and we had to it's, it's get good. an Xbox Live subscription in order to do that. And <laughs> that was a month, but you got it for free because Bing or whatever. And then you're like, "What else can we play?" So we played Anarchy Reigns, and then we played uh, my. I tricked you to play Mind Jack with me. Mind Jack fucking sucks. Mind Jack. It's a third person shooter. Uh, where one player takes control of the good guys and other people can hack into your game and take control of the bad guys. You can become a red or blue phantom if you want. You can be a friendly. You can be a friendly. Um, and so to progress in the game, you have to beat not only the AI, but someone else who is able to take control of any of those AI at the set, at sort of, <laughs> they can only do one at a time. Um, but you basically have to beat that person. And if they play like a cheater, like like, Mitch does, it can be very cheater. difficult. The boy is a legitimate strategy. <laughs> Go watch the boy coming in video, the boy dear listener, if you want to know that what Mind Jack is in. like. If they didn't want people to play it like that, why did they put the boy in the game? Mind Jack is a dull third person shooter not saved by the fact that other people can hack into your game to annoy you um but we had fun with it the story is nonsensical and uh kind of doesn't i think by the end of the game it really doesn't make sense what the fuck's been going on um so yeah that's mine jack we've also been playing through every david cage game <laughs> oh. <laughs> but we've been doing that this year though right right we don't when did we start the... we started that know. last year didn't we we don't need to talk about every david cage game we can have a special but well uh, dear listener we'll have a special bonus podcast where we talk about every david cage game we played okay genuinely i would love to have a special david cage bonus podcast because oh, thinking about the inside of that man's mind is disturbing on so many levels pop quiz hot shot 
I think I want Bran to introduce the idea because this all came off um, the back of us being in Wales and Bran finding something in a shop there. So Bran, do you want to give us your recollection? So during meetup in September, September, yeah, September, we were in Wales and we stumbled across, we were in like a mall, right? And we found this like odds in, was it not really a mall, was it? Call it. Oh, it was an arcade. It was an arcade. It's a shopping we center. It's not an arcade, shopping center, whatever. You guys have weird words for <laughs> shit. <laughs> We stumbled across a small, like, odds and ends, like, old shit store, and we found two books of the topper, which I did buy and currently have in my hands, one for 1982 and one for 1989, and apparently the rabbit hole for who, like, for, like, the change in hands and all of these comics has changed a lot, and so Specs has created a diagram going through all of that. That he's put in way too much effort into as he always does oh jesus i'm looking at it it's like a conspiracy wall there's some very um it has its own unhinged key. comic names yeah do you want to give us a highlight do you want to sure yeah let me i'm 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 thumbing through it right now the there's tricky dicky <laughs> the greatest gangster of them all Yep, he was their mascot for a time, I believe. Nick Kelly, special agent, and Cedric, his assistant in the m case of the mysterious mole. That one's not that funny. Wasn't there one called Timmy the Tranny or something like that? There's, there's da Danny's Tranny, which is about Danny's a transistor tranny. Oh, radio. Yeah. That is what people used to call transistor radios in this country. So Daniel's transistor radio is a story about <laughs> a, a boy who has a transistor radio that can do things like make his arm longer if he points <laughs> it at things. So at one point in the comic, he says, I'll use my tranny powers to make my arm grow longer. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> it was a different time. It's like reading comics written by an alien. I got a s super boy, but it's like soup, like the 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 liquid. Yeah. This chum soup is really strange. One sip can cause a powerful change. <laughs> it's basically just like Popeye, but instead of spinach, it's soup. <laughs> My experience with uh, British comics is my dad had a lot of uh, a comic called The Whoopee, uh, <laughs> which doesn't feature in DC Thompson, uh, but it featured such cool characters as the Evil Eye, which was a, a disembodied floating eyeball that would zap people and make them evil, but it would never make them do evil things the Evil Eye would want. There was also Butkins Billionaires, who were like this classic... <laughs> uh, lower class family but they were just billionaires and they would always be like scammed by people uh but they would always come out on top uh they would always try to give away their money but whatever that they did to try and get rid of their money would just make them richer and the my favorite was uh, a comic strip called sweeney toddler which is about <laughs> a uh baby that is uh, a sociopath that, that tries to uh, kill and injure people, but it, again, it never works out in Sweeney Toddler's favour. What I like about all these fucking British comics is that you just start with a title pun yeah. and work <laughs> yeah. outwards from that. Yeah. Who could forget Pete Butt Pike and his brilliant bike? <laughs> You see, it was aspirational. Not every kid could get a bike back in the day. First comic has like the has like a motorcycle with like, a little face on it with a speech wall saying, "Yeah, I'm magic." So the reason I think this really fell into our radar was we were looking at this and I was like, I've never heard of the topper before, but I was reading through Brian's toppers and I was like, I've recognized some of these characters from other British comic books I've read, like the dandy. And we did a quick search and we found out that the topper eventually became the Beezer and the topper because it combined with a comic called the Beezer and eventually got rolled into the dandy. And we were like, okay, w what else? So we looked at the Beezer and it turned out that it absorbed other comics as well. And 
through about, I would say, nine or ten hours of research over the last couple of days, <laughs> I have put together a comprehensive web of how these comics are connected. Um, there's a link in the Discord um, chat that you guys all might want to look at. Someone else had already made a similar timeline. It's not got quite as much stuff on it as mine, but it was a good source of information. Um, the, the really interesting thing is that at at all times, DC Thompson, who um, are the producers of these comics, had multiple conflicting comic series, not conflicting, but competing, competing comic series aimed at the same type of audience um, that were doing essentially the same thing with the same writers and artists, for the most part, making similar comics for young boys and girls. And they all got rolled into one comic eventually because it was stupid that they had five things that all did the same thing. <laughs> this this all begins in about 1921. So we're between the two world wars and they have what's called the Big Five. Uh, the Big Five are Adventure, Rover, Wizard, Skipper and Hotspur, um, which were not necessarily comic books. They're not necessarily comic books. A lot of these were just like written texts, like short stories for young boys to read. And I think because we were like in the midst of two wars, there was a lot of like, you know, stories about soldiers and stories about combat and things like that. So the other major thing that DC Thompson does, the one of the biggest things that DC Thompson um, publishes is the Sunday Post. They also do another uh, Dundee-based newspaper. So some of the things we're going to talk about have existed in the Sunday Post as um, comic strips in that. You know how newspapers will generally like have Garfield or that hot Limmy, goth my niece. chick. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, stuff like that. So uh, in the Sunday Post, you have Oh Woolly, um, which is how you would pronounce Our Willy, I think, um, if you were Scottish. So it's written in Scots. You have the Bruins, who are the, the Browns. Um, but you have a number of things like Wishbone Wuzzy, which was also in The Skipper, um, which was uh, one of these um, one of these written sort of adventure stories things was The Skipper. The Skipper also had a side comic called The Midget Comic. Um, so called because it was a small comic book, not because of any uh, people that featured in it. Um, and this, this was also also a supplement to i believe the wizard for some time um it it came with the rover it came with the wizard it came with the skipper and some of the comic strips from those appeared as well in the sunday post and are potentially still going on so um you can see how dc thompson already was crossing over their properties with things from skipper getting into their newspaper comic strips um we talked about the big five so we've got uh, adventure um we've got the rover we've got the wizard for instance um and adventure was absorbed into the rover eventually um the the rover was absorbed into the wizard at some point and these were all mostly text-based stories with some um some cartoon strips um as things moved more towards cartoon the wizard got rolled into the victor oh my god I'm there's so many of them and hence this is all <laughs> The Hotspur, which came from the Hornet originally and was absorbed by that. The Hotspur rolled into the Victor as well. Buddy, which was very short-lived, rolled into the Victor. Bullet was mainly comics, got rolled into Warlord, and Warlord got rolled into the Victor. So did Scoop. Down here on the right, we've got <laughs> Champ. Champ came from Spike, and they all got rolled into the Victor as well. Okay, so the Victor actually didn't get rolled into anything, really, once it finished in 1992 but we're talking about the Victor being there from 1961 to 1992 and absorbing comics and um, magazines that had been going since 1921. Uh, I've chosen it that, like, the key essentially is a big arrow uh, means that a comic got absorbed by another comic. Uh, a dotted line arrow means that, say, I flew with Braddock here, for instance, this was originally in, I mean, it was in Red Dagger as well. That's what a double dotted line shows. But a single dotted line shows that originally <laughs> that came from the rover. So the rover had stories of I flew with Braddock. The wizard probably did as well. And adventure probably did too at some point. Um, it was reprinted in Red 
Dagger, which is why there's so many different lines coming off Red Dagger because it just reprinted from the Big Five. Um, but I flew with Braddock, was eventually absorbed into the Victor when the move happened because not all of the stories that were running in, say, uh, Warlord, for instance, got transferred across to the Victor when Warlord became Victor. They just kept the best stuff. Um, things that people will probably know about DC Thompson that they will have actually heard of are the Beano and the Dandy. So the Beano has been running since 1938 uh, and is still running. The Dandy has been running since 1937. It finished in 2013. It had a brief spell online in 2013 before folding and it still gets a yearly annual. Wasn't it partly absorbed into the Beano? So not really. Characters from the Beano uh, and the Dandy haven't really crossed over very much. I couldn't find any um, solid evidence. There is one instance, I'm going to zoom in on it uh, in a second, of Desperate Dan and Dennis the Menace crossing over. The, uh, the all-time greatest crossover. Suck on that, Marvel. Dan the Menace and Desperate Dennis. Um, and, and that's like <laughs> the only time the two of them ever met. Um, but there's, there's very various da uh, dandy and beano properties you may have heard of anyone remember the bash street kids yeah the bash street kids is good actually oh wait yes yes i, I do remember recognize these, these characters I remember most of these. these ugly characters love the ugly characters the interesting thing about the bash street kids is every comic that dc thompson put out had a version of the bash street kids which was a group of children that got into mischief at the, their school you would have various archetypes in these characters so you'd have the ugly one which in the Bash Street Kids was plug. And then you have the other <laughs> ugly one. The dirty one, which is Smithy over on the left of this. You had the smart one, which is probably, I can't remember his name, but like he's it's like right down at the bottom. Yeah, it's the <laughs> one with glasses. And these were like the general archetypes. You had the one who was kind of like a bit of a chancer, like an artful dodger type, which is whoever the guy on the right is there. Um, and the, basically, like that's who the Bass Street Kids are. Now, um, Bass Street Kids also each had a dog, uh, and those were the pup <laughs> parades star starring the Bass Street pups now they originate in the beano but oh no where are they going where are they going they ended up in hold on <laughs> uh, let me trace this out they ended up in the topper which Why is what, what the brand owns topper? they moved on to the topper so um until the topper folded and was merged into beezer and topper <laughs> And then eventually they worked their way back to the Beano because Beezer and Topper folded and got folded into the Dandy and the Beano at some point. Um, you know, the individual strips, although the comic no longer existed, did get rolled into their other places. Um, you've got Sparky over here. Sparky got rolled into the Topper. Buzz got rolled into the Topper. Hoot got rolled specifically into the Dandy. But the only thing that ever came out of that is Cuddles and Dimples. So Cuddles was a character from Hoot. Uh, oh, wait, no. Cuddles was a character from no Nutty originally, who moved into Hoot when Nutty folded into the Dandy. Dimples was a character originally from the Dandy, but when Hoot got rolled into the Dandy, because the characters were so similar, they put them together in a series called Cuddles and Dimples. Cuddles used to have his own parents. They were removed from the comic after he moved into the Dandy and they're never mentioned again. <laughs> the, the thing you need to communicate here is that these comics were all owned by the same fucking company yes and all the characters all basically look the same no these kind of hands. weird round-headed cab cauliflower eared single toothed shit-headed children <laughs> and there's no child in the entirety of britain who ever bought more than one of these things at a time the reason they all look the same is because they've all got the same artists and writers i want to draw your attention to banana man who was originally from nutty but then was a staple in the dandy and the beano um for some time we've got a character here from nutty the reason i've included this i've included just things with funny names really this is owen goal who was originally <laughs> called the cannonball kid owen goal is a lot funnier um i'm gonna come back to my my bid on the bash street kids now here's big fat flow by the way um she was in the buzz um so the buzz also had a series called skookum school skookum 
I don't know why it was called Skookum. I don't know why it was called Skookum School. Skookum School was another like series about a load of kids at school. They went to Skookum School. That's why it's called that. It's it's that it's got no relation to the Bash Street Kids. Um, but they essentially formed the same archetypes, and they were just in another comic. They were in Buzz. So eventually, Skookum School gets uh, gets into Cracker as you the headhunters of Skook- Skookum School, <laughs> and then. Time. probably um, got rolled into the Beezer at some point. There was also in Cracker a series called Spookum School which was about a bunch of kids who were ghosts. Spookum School has no relation to Skookum School. The kids in Spookum School are not the kids from Skookum School who have died. It has almost exactly the same name, was published in the same comics in the same time period over a year until Cracker folded into the Beezer and it just it just makes no sense it's ridiculous um, I'm going to zoom in on some Topper here so that you can see my favourite character from the Topper. Looking forward to this Uncle Dan the Medicine Man <laughs> Big Uggy <laughs> Big Uggy. It's Big Uggy. It's Big Uggy of hit. Oh, there's Nancy. I remember Nancy. Nancy is actually an import from America, so yeah, that's I the same so. Nancy but as American Nancy. 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 Yeah, so they God also, as well as everything that is on my list here, they have a few licensed properties and they did reprint stuff from other places. So there's some Belgium comic reprints that they did. There's some American ones. Um, Big Uggy is pretty good. Wild Young Durkey. we got Posty Knox, The Boston Boys. And of course... <laughs> Beryl, Beryl the Peril, not to be confused with Minnie the Minx, who was in the Beano. Beryl. Now, Beryl the Peril was absorbed into the Beano. No, she was in the Dandy. Oh, God damn it. Yeah, she may have eventually <laughs> become a, a Beano as well. She, they had Minnie the Minx. Minnie the Minx. Um, the, 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 I think it was in the Dandy, there was a character called the Smasher who looks almost exactly like Dennis the Menace. He wears the same clothes, he has the same hair, his face is almost the same. His character archetype was that uh, he would accidentally break things and get, and get into trouble, as opposed to Dennis the Menace, who would break things on purpose and get into trouble. It, we can't call them Dennis the Menace anymore because that's uh, property of uh, wh- whoever the fuck in America is. Now Dennis and Nasher is how you're supposed to call yeah. them. Dennis and Nasher, exactly. We'll come on to that. Um, I'm just going to go around some characters you may or may not have heard of. Uh, from the dandy, we've got Hungry, Hung- Horace. Hungry Horace, who just used to eat things. Hungry Horace! Um, Keyhole Kate was the face of the book for some time. She took over from Corky the cat, who's over here. I'll zoom on in, in on him in a second because he looks absolutely disgusting. Um <laughs> Keyhole Kate uh, was a character who just liked to peep through people's keyholes and got up to a number of stories based on that. Um, I don't know why she was chosen to be the mascot for the dandy, but they... Uh... Progressive female lead in the in the comic. Do you have Ed First in here? Oh, no, there's so many comics. I haven't gone into specifics about a lot of them. Here is Corky the cat. <laughs> He'll be first or burst. <laughs> that's, that's, oh, that's Corky. Why did they make that? And here's some close-ups of Desperate Dan eating a cow pie and shaving with a scythe. Love cow pie. Desperate Dan's whole thing was that he, he became eventually the face of the dandy. His whole thing was that he was the strongest man in the world. He slept on a pillow filled with gravel. He shaved with various implements, which often were referred to as blow torches. Um, and uh, he could lift a cow with one hand. Dude, look at that jawline. He eats cow pies. He's a cow Those boy. Those cow pies always looked uh, delicious. Do you know about how he stopped eating cow pies eventually? Do you know why? Is it mad cow disease? Is it mad cow disease? Mad cow disease. During the ma- uh. mad cow disease scare, he stopped <laughs> eating cow pie. Um, I'm going to take you back to the Bash Street Kids because I think this exemplifies everything. A lot of the Bash Street Kids is crossed over. So we have a line coming over here. So two two hard lines here <laughs> indicates that something is a connected series. There's Roger the Dodger. He was in the Beano occasionally, but uh, no, he was in the Beano mainly, but occasionally the Dandy. So for some reason, Plug got his own comic book, like not just like his own story. He got his own comic book called Plug. He got an entire comic book. <laughs> Yo, he made it big. <laughs> 
for Plug having his own comic, which lasted two years, that's longer than Cracker, he uh, he was given his own cast of orbiting characters. So as well as his dog from the the pups, um, the pup parade, which we've already talked about, he was also given a monkey. And Plug had a pet monkey, apparently, which was in Plug. So Plug eventually folds into the Beezer, um, which eventually merges to become Beezer and Topper. But this is how crazy this was. They were like, you know what people like? They like Plug. They don't like the rest of the Bass, Bass Street Boys. They like Plug. Let's give him his own comic for two years until he gets it's rolled like into Joey Beezer. And yes, it is like Joey and Friends. I've got a little line here from uh, Beezer and Topper because in Beezer and Topper, so this is Nasha and Dennis the Menace. We've not really talked about Dennis. He's arguably the most recognisable character from the Beano. Uh, his whole story, as with most of the boys in the Beano and the Dandy, is that he gets into mischief and gets told off by his parents. That's all they ever do. Good for him. Good for him. Nasha, his dog, um, has babies at one point in the the Beano. Um, and this is from a Beano comic strip originally, um, which is Dennis and Nasha. Uh, this is good Natasha um, or Natasha. So they all start with a GN. Good Natasha. Natasha got her own um, series oh, of stories. <laughs> and uh, ended up in not only, I think, the topper. Hold on. Right. I can't imagine a Beano reading kid wanting to know what happened to Natasha and being told to read the fucking topper instead. So as well as being in Beezer and Topper, she also... Yep, the line is there. If we come all the way over here, <laughs> Wikipedia suggests that she, or perhaps all of um, Nash's puppies, other than Nipper, who was his main boy puppy, were also in Jackie. And this is a part of my spider diagram we've not seen yet. This is the girl side of DC Thompson. The forbidden side. Nikkei, look! <laughs> no, that's Nikki, not Nikkei. Oh, oh. <laughs> As well as having... Diana? As well as having uh, Diana, yeah, probably named after the one herself, Princess. What did that get folded into when she died? Camilla. A, a car crash, I think. Diana got folded into Jackie. Um, interesting fact about Jackie. People say that Jackie is named after Jacqueline Wilson, who is an acclaimed children's author who worked at DC Thompson while Jackie was being published. It's not true, but it is true that she worked on the Jackie comic while it was being made. So um, it, it's not just a thing that happened with the boys' comics. The girls' comics also all got folded into each other. So Cherie got folded into Romeo, which got folded into Diana, which got folded into Jackie. Uh, Jackie uh, got some stuff from... L oh, no. It, Jackie put stuff in Lucky Charm because Lucky Charm was like Red, uh, Red Arrow. So it just reprinted stuff from all of the other girls' comics that were going on at the moment. Um, Jackie didn't eventually get folded into anything uh bunty was eventually the main um the main girls comic which ran from 1958 to 2001 uh, and it absorbed things such as spellbound which was a girls horror themed comic book uh, which got rolled into debbie which got rolled into mandy which got rolled into mandy and judy which came from judy which came from tracy and emma and mandy and judy got rolled into bunty which had also rolled in Susie, which also rolled in tv tops which was originally just called tops uh and uh, and Nikki as well. The only like thing I could find that was mentioned about stories that I could say were rolled in was there was one called The Comp in Nikki, which definitely made its way across to Bunty. You also had another set of girls' comics for younger girls. So Twinkle is what ended up there. Twinkle absorbed Pepper Street, which was a licensed property based on some cartoon, I think, and Little Star. There's a connection between Little Star and another comic all the way over the other side of the diagram over here because that was related to where is the magic beano book um which was mm. uh, a combination of the beano and the magic comic uh which was aimed at younger readers uh, and it was eventually revived as the magic comic revival which i believe is what i've got connected over here somewhere to twinkle because it got rolled in uh, little star what's going on with little star 
the face on Biffo, by the way. Oh, yeah, we'll Biffo talk about Biffo is Biffo horrible. It's, it's a great, good face. great face. Little Star also included stories about Baby Crockett, who was originally in the Beezer, but also appeared in the comic book Bimbo. <laughs> Bimbo. Every every combination of word <laughs> letters has been used up by this fucking comic company. It feels like I'm looking at a list of ZX Spectrum games. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to... Um, uh, the Magic comic also had Peter Piper who picked people out of pickles. Um, and uh, he eventually got rolled into the topper. I want to show you We Are United. So We Are United was a running strip about a team of footballers called United FC. Um, wasn't specified where they were in the country. So We Are United was a crossover um, series like The Avengers um, in, wow. uh, in US comics, but for various footballers who had appeared in other DC Thompson comics, such as Iron Bar, who was a goalkeeper from Spike. Did Owen Gold get in here? I don't think Owen Gold did. <laughs> Justice but for <laughs> Owen Gold. Limp along Leslie did, and he's from the Wizard. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's that's sort of what happened with football. And eventually We Are United started showing up in Football Picture Story Monthly, which was a monthly magazine about f- football, real-life football, but also had football-based comic stories such as We Are United. Um, looking at other things, uh, Cuddly and Dudley, the magic comic revival. So we can see here that this this came from the the second run of magic comic i'm just going to zoom in on it and see if you can recognize one of the characters in here <gasps> is that is biffo? that is that biffo is that biffo is that biffo there is that biffo the bear so biffo was the uncle of cuddly and dudley and as we all know <laughs> biffo oh was the God. original mascot for the beano so why is he there because they're all owned and written by the same people uh, I'm going to come over to Biffo. He wasn't actually the original Look mascot. I've Look told you a lie. Here, this is the this is the Wikipedia picture <laughs> of Biffo. This is where Biffo appears. Now, Biffo is in some way connected to something over here because he also appeared in Twinkle. Uh, Shoutouts to Shout Magazine and High Exclamation Point, by the way. <laughs> Pinups, boys. The original mascot of the Beano. Was none other I than know this yeah. guy. Big Ego. Did you take my eggs? <laughs> this DC Thompson obsession started because of my <laughs> fascination with the fact that they would name a character Big Ego. I didn't quite realize how that that was only the tip of the iceberg. Tip of the iceberg to you. Yeah, so Big Ego was an ostrich. Um, for some reason, an ostrich was the mascot for the Beano. It was the, the first character that really took off. And the reason they made Biffo the bear is because they felt that uh, people <laughs> people so could good. not people could not relate to an avian character as well as <laughs> to a mammalian character. What's he looking at? What's he thinking about? Thinking about big ego. He's just real happy. He's thinking about the One Piece and how it's real. <laughs> um, this is Harry Dan, um, who <laughs> was originally from the Beano, but eventually became Harry Dan, the football fan. Over in, I believe, Beezer and Topper. Oh no, just the Beezer. It's like they realised they had a character that didn't rhyme in the name of the comic and they corrected it. Okay, so I think one of the most important things I found while researching this oh my is this strip. I'm going to zoom in on it. Addy and Hermie. Oh my god. Addy and Hermie, the Nasty Nazis, was uh, a comic strip that appeared in the Dandy between 1939 and 1941. It was about Adolf Hitler and Hermann Goering uh, and how they were bumbling idiots who would break everything. Uh, It features the characters speaking in German based English. So, like how, what we do when we Like what German we do when, when we talk in German. Der Hell. Der Jaul. Der Jaul. Der Rafters have let us down, mein leader. Der Help. 
<laughs> was this comic made during the Second World War? This was yeah. made right at the start of the Second World War. So it was 1939 to 1941. So this was a bit of propaganda. But uh, that goes back to the Big Five, which were all propaganda to get kids interested in joining the army for the next big war that we had. I'm going to show you a comic that we've not talked about yet. It's not connected to any of these other properties, but it uh, other other than bifo. the Beano, other than the Beano, this is the only ongoing comic that they have that's not based on another property or like a lifestyle magazine. Commando has been running since 1961 up until this day it's still being published and it's just stories about people who work in military backgrounds. It's just weird, and I guess that comes from... I don't think it rolled anything in from the Rover or the Wizard or anything like that, which were also war-focused, but it comes from the idea that kids, I guess, really want to read about what's going on in wars. Well, you know, that was the thing at the time, G.I. Joe, whatever. You have your uh, kids, yeah, that, kids like to play war. No, I think Commando is the nucleus of not only, like, Call of Duty, but also of, like, Tom Clancy mm. novels and things like that. Oh, yeah, it's got a lot of that. And, I mean, there, there's always been that. We've got the Dixon Hawk Library here, which uh, pre precedes Adventure, but eventually got rolled into Adventure. I didn't really zoom in on Skipper, but um, the reason I put a picture of Skipper here is because this particular picture is of a monkey about to spank a man with a cane. <laughs> As you do. Yeah, fucking get him. Get him. Got him. Look, there's another one in the background. <laughs> Good old corporal punishment. When Smex was in the military, he served with a guy called Corporal Punishment. I did, yeah. Corporal <laughs> Punishment. Um, we've got here Jimmy Johnson's Grockle uh, as well. <laughs> <laughs> A grockle is, is kind of some sort of dragon crossed with a dog. Some cryptid or something. Mm. Yeah, it's some sort of cryptid that um, that uh, Jimmy owned. Uh, this is the Wolf of Kabul, which had a prequel series called Young Wolf that appeared in Warlord, but the Wolf of Kabul was originally from The Wizard. Um, the Wizard got a revival at one point, but as far as I can tell, there was nothing related um, in The Wizard relaunch to what happened in The Wizard originally. Uh, I'll come back to that in a bit, I'm sure. Um, looking at Jimmy, Jimmy and his Grockle, um, so originally this was called... Jimmy Johnson's Grockle. It was republished as Jimmy and his Grockle in The Dandy, but it was also <laughs> called something else and reappeared in another comic. So it was in Sparky as My Grockle and Me. <laughs> <laughs> he, but for those not blessed with the video, he was like scrolling around on his chart for like a full minute because there's <laughs> so many lines. There are so many lines. I want to tell you a little bit about the crunch. Um, so the crunch, uh, which included Man Tracker, this is the Man Tracker, and this is his next target. Um, and Starhawk, uh, this was um, DC Thompson's answer to 2000 AD comics, uh, which is Judge Dredd and the surrounding comic scene around that. So for people who have heard of Judge Dredd but not 2000 AD, Judge Dredd was just one of the bigger stories from a series of comics um, that were uh, in. 2000 AD, which told lots of different sci-fi and dystopian style stories. So um, they came up with Starhawk. Starhawk appeared in Star Blazer comic as well. Um, that didn't really get rolled into anything. The Crunch eventually got rolled into the Hotspur. Uh, Starhawk also appeared in Spike. Um, I can't remember what Spike was about, but at least some of it was football. Spike also contained Crazy Cops, which was a humorous strip. Um, Crazy Cops uh, was a relaunch of L Cars. Um, it's a it's a comedy about policemen, um, and that was originally from Sparky, for instance. Uh, over here, we've got some other orbiting things that I just knew were in the Sunday Post, so I included them. So Nosy Parker was in The Beezer. It was also in the Sunday Post, which is uh, as just a general comic strip. Um, um, and originally it was in the rover uh, i think as part of the rover's midget comic um you got nero and zero the rollicking romans who also showed up in the sunday post for a while uh other things that we haven't talked about yet i like that there's the all these children's cartoons and it's just that some of them appeared in the actual newspaper the sunday post 
Yeah. Um, other things, uh, the Beano also had an offshoot called Epic Magazine, um, which is one of those magazines you can still get now that's like got a little toy on the front and it's all like plastic covers and stuff. It talks about video gaming as well, I think. Um, Epic Magazine was originally called Dennis the Menace and Nash's Epic Magazine. Uh, before that, it was called 100% Official Dennis the Menace and Nash Magazine. And before that, <laughs> it was called Beano Max. Beano, when you when the Beano on its own isn't enough, you have to start Beano Max. Sing. Beano Max. <laughs> they they had a Beano Max. They had a Dandy Max. Uh, I think there might have been a Beza and Topper Max at some point I as well. I that someone at DC Thompson was like, "We don't have enough comics. Let's make a, a, a different version of the Beano and call it the Beano Max." So w- were these were these comics popular in like different regions? No, they weren't even popular in our country. <laughs> National? Were they in certain regions or? Because I, I can imagine there being like school kids who go, oh, the Beano, that's for fucking whatever. Like, I only read this because this is the thing that's popular here. You've got to go like three yeah. miles down the road for the Beano <laughs> to be popular. Like, I can, I can imagine them being popular in different of regions of the UK and kids having just no idea that they're all the same thing. I asked a couple of people about this and um, they would say things like, oh, I like the Beano more than the Dandy and thought that they were published by different people. Um, and they're not. They're written by the same people. Uh, they have the same artists. It's the same writing room for a lot of it. Uh, they they are just segregated by these characters live in the in the dandy universe and these characters live in the Beano universe. Except they don't because they constantly get folded into one another and then DC Thompson makes a new publication. Yeah, I, I mean, I can understand having a magazine for girls and maybe you've got a magazine for girls that's more like comics focused and maybe you've got a magazine for girls that's more talk focused so i could understand you having jackie and having bunty but i can't understand you having mandy and judy at the same time that did basically the same thing and that's why they eventually became mandy Mandy and judy Judy at the same time i I don't get it Um, i don't get it the reason i brought us over to this corner is because this is where the more adult comics live so i say adult they're not sexy but they are romantic so we have star love stories which ran from 1965 to 1990 star love stories absorbed four different love stories um comic magazines and these weren't like picture stories these were written stories as well but why did you have love and life library golden heart love stories silver moon romance and blue rosette romances all running at the same time like starting within two years of each other and then eventually roll them into star love stories because they were just fighting each other it made no sense you could have just had one romance book i really don't understand this is what baffles me i don't understand anything about why there were so many things doing the same thing i'm gonna go out on a limb and think it's regional focused because like even as much as like in the 70s and like the maybe the 80s as well you didn't really have I think national industry is probably the wrong way of putting it because you did have that but you didn't have like national focused media in the same way like you had a lot of very regional focused stuff back then like and despite despite the fact that britain is a very small kind of like region of the world like it does have very it's seg- it's segmented very regional focused places yeah it's very very segmented by like exactly where you are and it can be like a matter of miles as to whether like individual like single figure miles as to whether something is targeted at you as an individual or not based on where you are um genuinely bizarre but i could i could believe that that's it that reminds me of the, I don't know if any of you have seen that video. I think Tom Scott did it of like the um, the 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 children's song and how it's it, it's altered based on where in the UK you you live. Which song? Oh, it's um the Jingle Bells, Batman Smells. Jingle Bells, Batman Smells. Yeah, yeah, that one. Oh yeah, I bet you could tell like regional lines. It did from like that. a map of like of of it. It's very fascinating. I'll link it. But it's like yeah, in the pre. In the pre-globalization era, like somebody from Reading probably wouldn't be un- able to understand the accent of somebody from yeah. Yorkshire. <laughs> He's speaking different languages. The microculture would have been very, very different as to like A, what they were interested in and B, 
like how it was marketed to them. I'm betting that DC Thompson was just a fucking stupid company, though. So. It could just be that. I mean, there was a lot of that going on in like the the 60s to the 80s as well. Like it reminds me on a on a microcosm. Which, sorry, this is the microcosm of the DC thing, which is microcosm. Oh, I can't even remember their names now. The Super Marionation people and all the attempts that they oh, made yes. to make a super popular like TV show with marionette puppets. Like eventually, they settled on a couple of things that. Got got really popular but like they they had so many runs at it over like 20 years or so and they all seem just very bizarre they just tried them out in the hopes that one of them would stick yeah pretty much and they wanted to get syndication in the u.s and it never really stuck like they had one go at it and it wasn't the one which they thought was the most popular so they they stopped it like it got very very bizarre it's worth looking at that as a as a side thing at a later point, but this is this this seems to me very similar. I'm gonna point out a couple more things. So the big palooka I put in there just because I thought that was funny. Um, it's good. It got a sequel series called The Son of the Big Palooka. It was originally in The Wizard, and then The Son of the Big Palooka was in The Hotspur. I'm gonna scroll us out so you can see this this web that I've made. Put ominous mu- music over it when you do the scroll out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, it's fucking massive. There's so many of them. So although not everything is connected, I think a lot of the information here has been lost to history. So there was, in this guy's blog I was reading that helped with a lot of the research, um, he said one of his friends could have sworn that um, the skipper got rolled into the victor or something like that, but he couldn't find any (laughs) evidence for it. Um... Or it might have been adventure was was rolled into something, but it, it was like okay, so he couldn't find any evidence of it from like a comic book that said adventure now part of you know whatever it might have been. But um, so there's probably been things like I can't imagine Jackie just kind of stopped. So there's probably a lot of information um, about individual strips that were in Jackie that got moved into Bunty when Jackie stopped existing. Similarly, like there's so many things like the Beezer and the Topper just stopped, but I know a lot of their characters moved on to be in the Dandy and in the Beano, for instance. So what's also not caught here in my diagram is I've put on all of the comics that they they ever owned other than like the licensed stuff or the the less interesting stuff that was like you know Gardener's Weekly or whatever um but uh I've not put on even like one percent of the comics that were in each of these things each of the like the Beezer if you look at the list of comic strips that ran in the Beezer for its however many years like 20 year run um there there are hundreds of individually named characters and comic strips and they all have stupid names like wondrous wellies (laughs) and like (laughs) jimmy the the thinny mamini or something I, they've all got <laughs> such stupid names what i'm imagining is a is a writer's room with like 30 people in it and each and each of them is being told to come up with like a new comic for the bindo every single <laughs> week and they're just like uh, F- F- freddy the ape and his magic grape and then that yes goes, that, <laughs> yeah. it's jimble and his thimble and then that comic runs for 20 years, moves through eight different comics. The person writing it writes like seven issues every day. Like, it's... It- <laughs> There's stuff like, so the Beano originally, it had a character called Lord Snooty, and he was just on his own for a while. Um, Lord Snooty is still a character in the Beano, but now it's Lord Snooty and his chums. And his chums are various other failed Beano characters that have been rolled into Lord Snooty and his chums. So <laughs> they have like a place a to live. The ground for abandoned yeah. Beano characters. <laughs> they ran a segment in the Beano once where they went to the Beano retirement home and, like, Big Ego and Biffo were like getting their meals from there. Yeah, what's not captured on here is although I've chosen specific comics because I think they're either relevant, like Cuddles and Dimples, which I thought was an interesting bit of story, or because they cross over in interesting places, there's probably hundreds of connections between various comics that I have no idea about because researching this is trawling through the Albion Comics Database Wiki, (laughs) the UK (laughs) Comics Wiki, old forum posts from like DC Thompson Forum Appreciation 
appreciation societies um this one guy's blog that was really helpful not for specific like comics that were, were not specific strips that were in these comics but for finding out just when the comics ran from and to and what they got absorbed into and wikipedia is not bad like wikipedia has some uh, if we if someone could like pull up the list of names of Beza comic strips that'd be really good and we can just run through the stupidest ones because they're like wikipedia has a comprehensive list of those but it doesn't necessarily tell you if they appeared in any other dc thompson properties or anything and i'm sure they did i'm sure once the dandy folded you started seeing like desperate dan show up more in the beano if you play beano town racing uh, on the pc for instance you, you can play as characters from the dandy and that corky the cat is in that desperate dan is in that banana man's in that uh, although originally he's from nutty of course um, of course of course of course, of course. I, I just want to i just want to say there are the, so many in the middle <laughs> here right in the middle bucko's flying bedstead did we mention tricky dicky i certainly think so here's general jumbo i remember general jumbo um yeah general, general jumbo, jumbo. Could control little army men his stand is bad company his stand is bad company yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh dreamy dick uncle dan the medicine man tommy's tiktok twin <laughs> willy wink the missing link <laughs> dicky bird young sid the copper's kid <laughs> Mr. Licko and his lollipops. <laughs> Attila the hen. The wallies of Winkle Street. Twit Hall. <laughs> the munchers. Can I tell you my favourite bit of Beano trivia? Go on. It, a couple of years ago, the Beano um, sent a cease and desist to uh, the MP Jacob Rees Mogg. Uh, because the, they said he looked too much like the fictional character Walter the Softy. Walter the Softy, lovely. <laughs> he does. You're right. That's funny. Uh, also, there is a uh, there's actually a statue of Desperate Dan in Dundee marking his birthplace, uh, but it's kind of a disturbing looker, if you ask me. <laughs> there's there's also a mini the mink statue in dundee yeah it's in, oh, it's in we the same fucking place do a meet up in dundee <laughs> no dundee has nothing <laughs> except these statue. two statues and that's enough <laughs> i like count spatula count spatula that's good that's good, good. <laughs> beefy dan the fast food man willie fix it i'm looking through the, my my copy again now the wizards of oz Oh, sorry, it's Willy Walker and the Wonderful Wizards of Oz. Oh, wait, on Oz. A lot of the amusement of these comics for me comes from the fact that characters seem to talk in just, like, incomprehensible, like, cartoon thought bubble words. Yahoo! You know, they don't just say yaf Yahoo, they have, like, their own lexicon of these words. Yeep. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to find it. It must be, like, the regional thing, maybe. Maybe this is a regional thing. Maybe he's right. It is curious that it lasted until the Thatcher years, which is when, like, we became a monoculture because globalization really started to kick in. Desert Island Dick. There's a lot of dicks. The ugliest pig in the world. Our <laughs> teacher's a walrus! Exclamation point. <laughs> Ali's Baba, the babe with the invisible bodyguard. Uh, he wasn't always called that. Hold on, he's on my he's on my <laughs> chart. <laughs> This panel has a character saying Gabble Bloop Noshti. Noshti. <laughs> Nosh is a good word. That's a word, that's a that's, word. that is almost solely now used in these Nosh. comics. Nosh. Okay, so as far as I'm aware, Ali and his barber, also known as Ali's barber, also known as Jimmy's Green Genie, uh, <laughs> originates in Sparky. Which then went to the top. Was absorbed which into the top. Which then went into the Beza and Topper, the which was and then absorbed Beza into the topper. Beano. So apparently, Alan Grant worked for DC Thompson for a while. Alan Grant was the writer for Judge Dredd at 2000 AD. So that is that is it's all very fucking close knit, isn't it? All of this community. Yeah, um, so you've also got the amazing Mr. X in The Dandy, who was um, the first British superhero, published in 1944. So this was wow. around the time that like the Human Torch and um, Captain America would have been published in the US, like the original run of them. Five Spunky Duncans. <laughs> <laughs> 
Absolutely. All of these comics are created in a meeting that lasted for 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I'm the Lord of the Harvest. I've been bringing this up. I, bring, I believe I brought it up to Specs and his uh, lady friends just as a way to try and bond with a female. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I, I asked them the question... What is worse to find in someone's room? Bottles of urine or moldy food on plates? And what's everyone's... Uh... So specifically, the, the bottles of urine are sealed. They've been sealed yes. after tapping. What's after worse? Tapping. What's worse? I still th I think the piss is worse. I think the piss is worse. The yeah. piss is worse. The piss mm. the piss tells a lot. I think. No, <laughs> for there to be sealed piss and for it to be found in someone else's room, they have to have not removed it at the first opportunity, right? But that's the same thing with moldy food. Yeah, I think the piss is worse. No, no, no. The decision to create a piss jar is an active exactly. decision. Yes. yes. That's the difference. Like, like, oh, you ate food in your room and like you left it for too long. Like, sure, it's gross, but like it's more understandable than what than there being a jar of piss in your room. You haven't deliberately created a piss jar. No, so I agree with Mitch on this one. Um, I think that the piss is fine or better. It's better than the, the food. Yeah, I'm the only person who has agreed with Mitch so far on this because the mold is contaminating the air. That mold spores are being created. You yeah. know. Whereas the piss is completely sealed. You made botulism, cats. You should be on my side. I mean, I won't question, I won't question that that is less hygienic, yeah. but it's still more unhinged. The piss is probably better for you, but it's still weirder. So here's the thing, though. I've made a decision, yes, to bottle that piss and seal it, but I've made the decision for hygiene. Whereas, yeah, you know, no, I, I think it is better to make is a. to piss in the toilet! I think it is better to make a hygienic decision than to accidentally cause yourself to create a biohazard. Pissing in a jar is not a hygienic decision. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with this with the simple the simple response. It's it's modern day bedpans. If I'm presented with both those options, the more visceral reaction that I have, the more emotional reaction is to the piss. And even if the piss is the more hygienic option, it still gives me a more visceral gut reaction than the food does. Therefore, Absolutely the piss agree. is worse. I can smell that food. If I went into someone's room and I saw they had a piss jar, I'd be like, oh, you decided that instead of going to the bathroom, that you would get a bottle or a jar and piss into it. Whereas if I saw moldy food, I'd be like, you have to clean up in here. It's gross. Yeah, it's grosser to have moldy food in the room, but it's gross on a spiritual level to decide to create a piss jar. Yes. Yeah. One of them deviates further from the normal human experience than the other, and it's the piss that deviates further. It's the fact that they seem to want to hold on to their piss. It suggests yes. things. Yeah. They didn't want to hold on to the food. They just did it. No, that's normal. Piss, so piss for hundreds of years was kept as a commodity in China back in the day. And that I don't know what that day not was normal. exactly. I don't China you, anymore. Your, your piss <laughs> was such a valuable commodity that you did not own your piss. Um, so when you pissed and you lived in someone else's property, you had to keep it in a jar and give it to your your landlord as part no. of your rent payment no yes but we don't do that anymore <laughs> piss is an important source of we don't uh, do that anymore. nitrogen it was, it was, it's it good was for, using gunpowder production it's way also back an when. important source of ammonia which is bad yeah. for plants you're, you're making it up specs no because you can use it to make fertilizer you can do that also they used it for gunpowder which was very important at one point if yeah. i if i met somebody for the first time and they had a piss jar i would never i would never forget that but if they yes. had the moldy food i'd be like wow you've just not had time to clean up, huh? man but like i, I could you probably must get have over a busy it. life what, what's the it can the food get to a point where it's so moldy that it overtakes the piss like it's attracting ants or if you thought you yes. saw like maggots in if the food there were maggots or worms or any kind of insects that would actually be worse than the piss in my opinion when i was moving out of 
dorms at uni when I was moving out of like um, sort of the shared housing, I found a large uh, pot, stainless steel pot in the bin. Oh no! Um, <laughs> and in in the kitchen, and I was like, you know, why would you just throw that out? That's that's a perfectly good cooking pot. So I went no to way. retrieve it, and it was face down in the bin. And as I turned it over. All I can describe the bottom of that pan is looking like is green rice. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. And I, I put that back in the bin and I walked no. away. You put that thing back where it came from. <laughs> yeah. So help me. Um, no. And I, I think having had that experience of extreme revulsion to mold, um, I can certainly say I'd rather see bottles of piss lining the walls than bottles of mould. Yeah, but Specs, have you ever had an extreme piss experience? I have an extreme piss experience every time I go upstairs to the bathroom. Specs' entire life is an extreme piss experience. You know what, Specs, when you come and visit whatever room you're in, I'll line it with piss jars. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Good for me. We'll, yeah. we'll line all of you guys is with moldy maggot food. Yeah, I'll bring moldy plates, plates for you. Yeah. Yeah. Now no, that I no, know you're okay with worse. moldy food hanging around, I'm not cleaning up after you if, uh, if I'm at your house. I operate putrevision. Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> true, true, true. But that's in a sealed jar. You're taking the best of both worlds. Yeah, that's in a jar, to be fair. So I guess uh, I guess I'm a hypocrite. But I, <laughs> at some point, though, it'll be a box and there will be a pork baby. I just need to acquire some dollhouse furniture. Yeah. Oh, well, you can get a table from a pizza. <laughs> Deadly Creatures is a video game for the Nintendo Wii. Uh, it uses motion controls to allow you to take full control of a spider and a scorpion in various chapters of the game while you are on the... Uh, on the trail of two men who eventually become one man. They merge? Um, not because they <laughs> merge, but because one of them is murdered uh, by the other man. And uh, you you have your revenge for that man, even though he's nothing to do with you. It just ends up happening that way. Um, the, the way it was described in the press at the time was telling an interesting story as though you were an insect on the wall of that story as it happens, but have no way of directly influencing it through most of the game. Yeah, that's fair. But also they've described the major problem problem with the game's narrative in the setup explaining it yeah there's like no reason for you doing anything that you do in the game from a plot point i think the conceit of it is each of the two um insects you play as are trying to find the other one so they can have a fight or something that's set up at the start of the game they're just wandering yeah. around in a big brown desert Yes, this is a very brown game. The graphics I can only describe as brown. It's a bit green in there. They look decent for a Wii game. Yeah, it, it, number one, it looks good for a Wii game. And number two, it's got really nicely rendered insects in it. Like, I'm not really insects an insect guy, but the animations are all really nice. That's because, that's because, as I posted that video, they put little motion capture balls on insects and arachnids and <laughs> had <laughs> them mocap their <laughs> movements. They did. It's true. the the motion The motion is very good. It's all very fluid. The scorpion has takedown animations for everything you kill, and they're like specific to what you're killing. So there's this really cool one where you're fighting mosquitoes, and it like rips the mosquito in half um, at the wings. So it like holds both sets of wings and just pulls. Um, lots of the finishes end with like it sort of suplexing them and then killing it with its tail. It's pretty neat from that point of view. I. I wouldn't say the gra like the graphics. If you stand the graphics up against like Super Mario Galaxy, obviously oh, Super on, you, Mario you... Galaxy is is like timeless. This uh, saying this looks good for a Wii game. Like I think cartoony Wii games look better. It looks okay, but, and definitely the insects look good. But I think the world looks bad. You need to play more Gingerbread Man and Anubis Two. As you say, most most Wii games look like pure trash but I think even like even though this game it looks good when you first look at it and after 30 minutes you're seeing the same brown desert oh, yeah, environment yeah, yeah, yeah. and after two hours you're still seeing the same brown desert you can unlock concept art throughout the game and you could see that they were way more ambitious there's like this underground I guess like termite nest 
and there were like way more colors yeah and it's like glowing and green and weird yeah, yeah. and there's like all these different like times of day in the concept art and all this stuff and it's very obvious that they just couldn't quite make the game that they wanted to because the game that they wanted to is an is an initially interesting but very quickly repetitive sort of shallow insect brawler yeah you unlock more moves as you go along in the game um rather than just your your simple sort of hit hit big hit combo that you start off with but even then they're not really that useful in combat you quickly find a strategy that works for most things they start giving you enemies that like you have to use specific moves to kill but then those specific moves work really well on everything so it's not like oh i'll use this because it's used for this enemy it's like well i'm doing this anyway and it works on this guy the combat is also really kind of dull because it's always just you and two or three other enemies in like a flat round arena um the game has all these other systems like you can walk on walls and ceilings and it's got like zero gravity as a spider you can like jump and sling webs and like you know see a web on the other side of the map and shoot towards it and pull yourself towards it and all of that like sounds really interesting when you describe it yeah but it never it's never used in the game for anything other than I see a web and I click on it with the Wii mm. pointer and I just teleport to it. Like, there's no... You're not Spider-Man 2 swinging over there. You're just yeah. picking a spot and going. The movement is just automatic. There's no platforming or traversal or anything. Yeah, these sections are kind of like... They feel like they're trying to be platforming sections, but they're, they're just boring. It's just walking to find the thing that you need to grapple to and then walking to the next one. Uh, and the scorpion doesn't have any of that, really. The scorpion is just fighting. Yeah, the scorpion can dig, which you do by shaking the Wii remote. <laughs> It uses all of the different Wii motion controls, which I don't know if that was mandated at some point by Nintendo or whether people just chose to do it, but it doesn't make the game more fun, really. No. Pre-New uh, Motion Plus era. Not good. And a lot of them are just kind of fiddly, and a lot of them, you do as either you do it during combat and you waggle to do some overpowered move that the game might misregister, or you do fucking frustrating waggling based quick time events, which is. Oh, yeah, those suck. Which I spent 30 minutes on because I am stupid. <laughs> so, Catsman played this game on an emulator yeah. and mapped the controls to the keyboard and then forgot the controls no, no, while no. he needed them. I, I was like, I'm a genius. Instead of doing this annoying waggle gesture to do my special move, I'll just bind it to a button. And then when I got to the quick time events, I realized I didn't know what the fuck what button did what action so i just failed over and over and over you see this is what nintendo are trying to protect consumers from when they sue the uh the the, the developers of emulators they don't want consumers to be caught in these struggles you need to play deadly creatures as the developers intended exactly in that case what the all the major video game manufacturers should do is get together and decide which of the four fucking face buttons is a which one is b and <laughs> so on because i am sick to death of getting a button prompt that says a and not knowing which goddamn version of a it's referring to so the major thing, the major selling point of this game that we've not talked about yet is that they got some big name voice actors to play the humans in this. So we have got Billy Bob Thornton and Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper? Dennis Hopper? Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. Uh, Dennis, Hopper. Dennis, Hopper. Um, Dennis Hopper's the murderer, as we found out at the end when we looked at the credits. But I'm sorry, Dennis Hopper, but you Dennis and Billy Hopper. Bob Thornton just sound like the same guy trying to do two different yokel voices in this game. Yes. You fight Dennis Hopper at the end Dennis of the Hopper. game um, as the scorpion, and uh, you kill him by stabbing him in the pee penis with <laughs> uh, the scorpion tail yeah hell yeah and you blow up a, a gas station well he blows up he shoots at you and blows up the gas station which also kills the other major antagonist which no, is just a though. snake a rattlesnake it does kill it it, it runs kills away, the snake I'm pretty it doesn't sure. run away here's, it here's my it experience with deadly creatures is that the climax was so boring that i mistook the ending for this game with I am bred. You did. Because yeah. I was I was certain. 
I was certain there was a segment where Dennis Hopper was driving away in his car to escape the scene, and you as the spider had to crawl around the car and then and then cause him to crash at the end. But that didn't. Ha- that's the ending of I Am Bread. <laughs> Well, the the problem with the story in this game and and just the way it progresses in general is you start the game, you're introduced to the scorpion and the spider, and you're like, oh, that's interesting. Two characters, setting, blah, 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 blah. And you're introduced to the two guys who are looking for treasure. And then you keep wandering through the desert, and they keep looking for treasure. And this happens for four, maybe five hours, wandering the desert, looking for treasure, being spider, being scorpion. Then Dennis Hopper kills Billy Bob Thornton. Uh, Then you arrive at the gas station and you have a different environment and then the game ends. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you you get into the house and you call around the house and not even a house. It's, it's a done. gas station. Yeah, it's like a gas station. I'm just thinking, like, wow, this game could have been substantially more interesting if a something happened in between the beginning and end of the story, or b you went to a different environment at any time other than the end of the story. The other good thing, I guess, about the game is you get interviews with Dennis Hopper and Billy Bob Thornton where they pretend like they're interested in the voice work they've just been doing. That is my favourite part. Hey, I, I, I think they're... I think they're professionals. They they can they can it's it's great watching Dennis Hopper try yes. to characterize what a tarantula thinks <laughs> as he's going about his various day life. Dennis Hopper was funny, but it was Billy Bob Thornton telling like a fifteen minute story about <laughs> like a spider in his car or something that completely won me over. I a hundred percent believe that that man is invested in the story of the spider. He's talking about rattlesnakes at one point, yeah, and he's like, we used to have this saying, I don't remember how it goes, but it was something like, if it's brown, put it down, and if it's red, go to bed. And, and it's clear that he can't remember the anecdote he's trying to tell, but he just like makes something up on the spot. Because he's a professional. Yeah, he really is. Uh, it's worth mentioning that the developers of Deadly Creatures, the, all they make is motocross versus ATV games. That's that's yeah. their bread and butter. And there's a cameo. There's the cameo of the ATV Chan from their various and uh, ATV games that is crashed in the pit that the spider can come across. It's a good little uh, Easter egg cameo. <laughs> it's also kind of sad though, because this game was obviously their attempt to escape from making Bank ATV it games on forever deadly creatures. and it didn't work could have deadly creatures too it's because the one of the lead devs were, was like i guess experimenting with like um rigging and like uh skeletons or whatever and he was like oh look at this snake i made this snake is pretty cool let's make a game of built around this snake and then they made spiders and tarantulas and the snakes the antagonist instead because i guess they couldn't get a snake to work in a thing we have to wait until snake pass came along before we fulfilled that dream snake rattle and roll my dude it's already been done at the end of the day deadly creatures is put a lot on watch mojo top 10 uh game hidden trailers gems. top 10 wii games of hidden 2009 wii gem games, whatever. number seven deadly creatures <laughs> and i am a proponent of uh garbage on the wii i love looking at garbage games on the wii but however if I compare Deadly Creatures to the heavy hitters, my Disaster Day of Crises and my Escape from Bug Islands, I Deadly Creatures barely reaches like my top ten. I think it is. It's just a. It's a bit too bland. Like Disaster Day of Crisis has has so many. It's Disaster Day of Crisis is kind of a bad game and it's also <gasps> kind of frustrating. But it has, it has so many overly specific ideas and weird, memorable things in it that it it elevates it over Deadly Creatures is kind of I don't know just blandness. Deadly Creatures has a very not interesting story and the way that it utilizes the Wii gesture system is not the story is not as weird and bombastic as Escape from Bug Island yeah even though Escape from Bug Island has very simple gesture uh, gameplay mechanics whereas Disaster Day Crisis has uh, it implements different ways you interface with the Wiimote as compared to Deadly Creatures Motion so that's why I don't 
rate deadly creatures yeah. super highly. Yeah, Disaster Day of Crisis go it goes it also goes harder into the like the Wii Remote mini games thing and probably does a better job of it. I'd say it's just got variety in gameplay. That's that's the thing that this game doesn't have. There's no variety in gameplay. It's a boring game. I think back to the light gun segments of Disaster Day of Crisis, and I. I think that Deadly Creatures is a better oh, brawler no. game than Disaster Day Crisis is a light gun game. <laughs> I don't know about that. No, Disaster Day Crisis is by far the better game overall. Uh, I, I do think Deadly Creatures is endemic of n- a, a particular era of gaming, both in its conception of being like a bug fights game and being a Wii core game in terms of like being a weird, stupid mid-budget game that nobody remembers, and also being really, really orange and brown. Yeah. It's a bit buggy though, isn't it? We- yeah. <laughs> I don't get it! <laughs> oh, actually, that's a good point. I uh, I found a couple of glitches um, and uh, I managed to I managed to do a sequence break at one point. Speedrunners, Deadly Creature Speedrunners, take note. It's called the Spec Scorpion. It's called the Spec Squeeze because you need to squeeze yourself into a space. Squeeze, does I it. I also managed to just walk through a, a wall at one point and fall out of the map. It didn't take a lot of looking. There's probably lots of places you can do that. But that kept me... That was the most fun I had with the game was doing that. <laughs> Do we want to spin the wheel? Yeah, I got it ready for you. We play a lot of bug games, don't we, Mr. Mosquito? Buck Bumble. Metroid, Metroid Prime! Prime. Oh, yeah. A good okay. video game. I the like question Metroid is, Prime. do I give Nintendo money for the new one? I've now, already done that. I have so I'll played play on that. the original Metroid Prime, but this would be a good excuse for me to um, try the remake. Uh, this this has been lunchtime. Thanks for listening. I'll get this edited sometime within the next year. Bye. <laughs> Why are you so sleepy? I love that. We've been going for three and a quarter hours. Let's go and watch some fucking wrestling. Yeah. Uh, Alright, love you all. Send us your bottles of piss. No, don't do that. And your moldy food. I I need to know if there's anyone else who takes the piss jar stance with you, Specs. I need to know. Specs does take the piss. I it's, asked, it's true. I asked Shiny the other day and she almost sided with me on the piss jar. And That's then, just because then you're she... very insistent. No, she she changed her mind when she thought about like it was a choice that you were making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. So she, she used... If I you guys had figure that up, the women said. would side with the mouldy food more because <laughs> how do they piss in a jar? Clean room. <laughs> okay, here's... Okay, if everybody... If it was normal to piss in a jar and you just hadn't you had just neglected to take your piss jar and empty it into the piss hole then i would be on the side of moldy food i'll get round to emptying the piss jars it's just there when you were there I'm noticing uh, Rate Play has a lot of. I don't remember no, that many people voting for that. I don't think we should have that. That, so, uh, should have that, that on the was wheel. added by our listeners, dear listeners. It was a very funny oh, joke. Oh, yeah, we did so, put that on there. I thank you for funny, that. Um, fun, funny joke. I think Rate Play should be there. I'm not sure I if guess, I agree. So we, we wouldn't stream it, but we could we talk could stream about it on Discord. It. Let me tell you something. Rayplay is one of the most significant video games in the era game genre. For a 2006 release, it is super impressive and sophisticated. Back then, Aerogay were mainly dating sims, puzzle sims, and RPG maker games, but Illusionsoft, rest in peace, they closed last year in August, were at the forefront of producing Aerogay using a 3D engine. Nowadays, that is commonplace due to engines like Unity and Unreal, but Illusionsoft were able to do it almost two decades earlier. With great technical achievements such as the weight and bounce of breasts and ass, with them being able to move independently, the ability to undress the girls in real time with clothing layers being removed real realistically, and also the physics and consistency of the cum. (laughs) 
Aluvinsoft truly cared about the game they were making, and it would eventually culminate in their masterpiece, Honey Select, a game engine that is still being used today in the doujin scene and modded heavily to accommodate a vast variety of fetishes and niches, so the game features sexual assault as its gameplay loop. So what? Rayplay has become the punching bag of the Eroge scene for too long just because of its provocative name, and it's been taken to task by people outside the country and culture the work was crafted in years after the game was released and not intended for an international market, in the same way that games such as Manhunt were taken to the stake during the early 2000s as well, by people who had never picked up a controller but instead saw scenes out of context and decided what was best for the public, without even taking into consideration that this game is purely fictitious, and the concept that someone who plays Rayplay will commit these offences holds as much water as saying GTA would train people to go on killing sprees. Sexual assault can be a sexual fantasy for some people of even both genders, and either gender can be the passive or active participant. As seen in one of Illusion Soft's later games, Yushakara Wahnigaranai, <laughs> or You Can't Run From The Heroines, the only crime Rayplay has committed is having a catchy, buzzwordy name that could be used as a gotcha by puritanical politicians to dictate what media another country could produce. And that's why it's on the wheel. <laughs> Mitch, I... Thanks, I, Mitch. So th there's an interesting point buried in here, because, I mean, you know, lots of, like, sexy literature uh, involves situations of non or questionable consent, and lots of it sells to people of all genders. But also, uh, I don't know, there's something about rape play that just seems particularly tasteless to me. And although if people enjoy it, I wouldn't necessarily go to their house and burn it down. I'm also probably not going to play it if it if the wheel lands on it okay me and mitch will do it <laughs> um i mean i i've killed plenty of people in video games yeah but killing people in video games feels different i mean yeah we haven't tried it i've got one more game i'm going to talk about it didn't come out last year, um, but it's Horizon 1 Dawn. I don't have anything to say about it. I just want to make the 1 Dawn joke, and I look forward to Horizon 2 Dawn. Thank you. That's getting, that's getting cut in the no. edit. Hey, that's getting cut in the edit. Be nice. Be nice. Be nice to Bram. See you later, alligator.